Good evening, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our city commission workshop. We'll start with a call to order and roll call. Okay, Mayor Brook. Here. Vice Mayor Carter. Here. Commissioner Sarah. Present. Thank you, Commissioner Vignola. Here. Commissioner Simmons. Not yet. City Manager Babinick. Here. City Attorney Hearn. Present. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to stand for a moment of silence, followed by the pledge. We'll have our city attorney, John Hearn, lead the pledge at the time. Please take a moment of silence for whatever is in your heart. Thank you very much. John, if you'd be kind enough to lead us in the pledge. My pleasure, Mayor. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, John. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. At this time, as we're still meeting virtually, if you could please read the virtual meeting statement, John. My pleasure, Mayor. This meeting is being held in, court, in accordance with Governor's Executive Order 2020-69 as amended through other executive orders and Coral Springs Resolution 2020-16. Due to the ongoing state of emergency and the recommendations from all public health authorities, the City of Coral Springs recommends that all persons view and participate in meetings through electronic means, which is what we're offering tonight. This meeting can be reviewed on, this workshop can be viewed on City TV, Blue Stream Channel 725, 25, 25.7, and AT&T UVerse Channel 99. It's also being streamed online at coralsprings.org backslash city TV and can be heard on city radio 1670 AM. For those individuals who may not have access to view that meeting, they have been noticed that they can uh, be here outside viewing the meeting on the city TV at 9500 West Sample Road, Coral Springs, Florida. And if you plan to attend, if you are out there, please practice social distancing. Remember, you have to wear a mask and stand no closer than six feet um, to those around you. Uh, and Mayor, uh, this, as this is a workshop, there is no uh, public call-in. Uh, so uh, having said that, we are prepared to start uh, your workshop. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, everyone. Nice to see everybody here. We're starting with workshop item number one, Federal Legislative Agenda for 2020. Mayor, thank you. Um, also, just as a note, I saw Commissioner Simmons popped on, uh, if, if you want to acknowledge uh, his Great. presence. Welcome, Commissioner. Good to see you. Good to see everyone as well. Congresswoman, uh, Dave, welcome, welcome to the show. I had a, had a protest right now, so I went to go to China, but I'm, I'm here, y'all. Great. Thanks for being here. Mayor, yeah. uh, yes. Mayor um, we have our, our first item uh, on the agenda. As you know, one of the uh, one of our initiatives was to have a federal lobbyist brought on board to help the city of Coral Springs tap into uh, anything that the federal government had to offer to us as, as a municipality. And uh, Deputy City Manager Bob Kernow is leading that up for us. I'd like to turn it over to him to give us a legislative update. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor and Commission. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity this evening to uh, present our federal legislative agenda for you. I just wanted to quick note that in your backup is going to be a more detailed document that I provided that's going to discuss uh, some of the highlights, which I'll cover in our presentation, uh, as well as our federal lobbyist who's going to have a conversation with us as well. And that's going to help us um, identify some key focus areas that we can align with that are both timely and uh, strategic as far as our initiatives are concerned. So as we begin, I'd like to introduce our representative uh, from our federal lobbyists, uh, the organizations I'll call the INFE, uh, Mr. Maurice Curland Esquire and partner, will be giving us a presentation and, and high level uh, objective of some of our priorities. We discussed things as COVID-19, the CARES Act, the HEROES Act, uh, smart legislation, and a uh, new transportation reauthorization bill that's out uh, called Invest in America. Just to give you a quick background on Mr. Curlin. Uh, Mr. Curlin has been active in government affairs since 1991. And per our phone conversation, sir, if you would uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you've been with your organization for 20 years now. 
Uh, Mr. Curlin is a native of El Paso, Texas. He holds a BBA in accounting from University of Texas at Austin. He also holds a Juris Doctorate degree from Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. So with that, please help me welcome Mr. Maurice Curlin. Welcome, Mr. Curlin. Maurice, are you with us? I am, I can see you. Fantastic, we can hear you. But um, for some reason, I'm trying to see why you cannot see me. Well, we have audio. Yeah, I can see the, um, I can see the in introduction to federal lobbyist. Um, so let me, let's see if, Let's see if the video comes up. I don't know why it's doing this, but let's see what happens. Um, I apologize because I know I had you before. No there worry. There you go. Okay. If you, all can, if you all can see me. We can see. We can see you. Okay. Well, first of all, good evening, and uh, thank you very much to your uh uh, city assistant city manager, your your deputy city manager, and your city manager for uh, the introduction. And first of all, I want to just say at the outset that uh, we are honored uh, to represent uh, Coral Springs here in Washington D.C. Um, as Mr. Kerno said, we have been lobbying our firm since 1973, so we are moving on five decades of lobbying. I myself have not been doing five decades, uh, but uh, I have been with the firm, as he mentioned, for 20 years. I am an attorney and lobbyist, and one of our specific expertise is advocating on behalf of municipalities. So I just want to say thank you for um, giving us the opportunity to represent your interests here in Washington. Uh, these are, are serious times, so I won't make uh, any jokes, uh, but other than this one, there, there are a few things going on here in Washington right now, uh, just a few. And so with that in mind, um, you know, when, when I was in first communication with Mr. Kernow, the discussion was, um, you know, what types of programs, what types of uh, projects, what types of priorities could we be advocating on behalf of the city? And immediately uh, thereafter, um, I gave him a general uh, overview of the types of things that we do, namely on transportation, infrastructure, uh, public works, community development, economic development, these broad areas. And then, of course, not long after that, we went right into the uh, uh, around the time of our discussions into the COVID emergency. And of course, now um, the, the major discussions about policing and public safety. So with that introduction, um, I would just say that uh, our business is about pursuing any and all available federal funding dollars for your city, number one, through appropriations, authorization bills, or federal grants and other programs. And so we have two components. One is the legislative side with the Congress and the other side with the federal departments and agencies which are continuously putting out um, grant notifications that we have a whole grants department to assist the city with that. And so let me just stop there with that and just say um, as part of our effort we have provided the city with a template, which I know Mr. Kernow um, has provided copies to you, at least electronically, just as a general framework of how the city might be looking at its priorities, looking at your capital improvement plan, looking at your strategic plan, and any particular priorities uh, that the city is looking at, whether it's, like I said, transportation, water infrastructure, economic community development, housing, um, Public safety, of course, which is your fire, police, emergency response, and any environmental or energy or other, other issues. So that's kind of an overview of what we do. We do represent multiple cities and counties. 
Our firm has a national presence, which um, since this is an introductory call, I just like to let you know, I mean, while you all have, I'm sure, a wonderful relationship with your members of Congress that are right there, the key for us and for you is we're your eyes and ears here in Washington, talking with the legislative staff um, that are based here in Washington and also leveraging our relationships across the country. We have clients in California, we have clients in Texas, we have clients, of course, in Florida and Virginia and other states. And when it's an issue that pertains to you all that maybe your particular member of Congress or the Florida delegation, while they, while they are positioned on certain items, we're able to go to these other members and access them on your behalf. Let's say they sit on a particular committee uh, that may be uh, Mr. Deutsch or Ms. Wasserman Schultz uh, or Mr. Hastings do not happen to sit on, for example. So that's just a, a brief introduction. Um, I want you to know that I have read a lot about each of you. I have gone on your website and taken a look at your bios. Uh, I appreciate uh, a reading about what has brought you to uh, elected uh, service. And um, I worked for elected officials. As we like to say, um, it truly is public service. I think we're seeing that, especially now, as you all are having to respond to COVID and all of these other uh, serious issues. So that's just a brief introduction. And as a lobbyist, I don't want to talk too much, but I, do, I did tell Bob I would give you all kind of a, just a general overview and then I would get into maybe some of the key bills, but let me just stop there and see if any of you all had any questions about me or our firm, I'll call Dan Faye. It is not just me. We have a whole team of people and my legislative assistant, Mackenzie Dobson is aware of this call. I have other partners in the firm that we will access and utilize because of their particular relationships or prior experience on Capitol Hill or with a federal agency. So thank you. And, and let me just stop there. Thanks, Maurice. Uh, my first question, then I'll put it out to the team, is where do you think our greatest opportunity lies? So, Mayor, it's a, it's, a, it's a great question, and it's a pointed question. So I think right now, uh, the two things that, that I think are most important for you all are, number one, this issue of we are here in this COVID environment, you're looking at additional expenditures you all have had to, to put forth for uh, PPE and other things related to COVID. At the same time, you're looking at significant budget budgetary uh, shortfalls. And so I think the number one thing that, that we're looking at is trying to get the Congress to provide direct aid, economic stabilization funding for the city. That's number one. Um, in the CARES Act, there was $150 billion that was directed to states, and it was directed to counties and some metropolitan areas that are over 500000 Well, that's great for them, but there's no requirement that they sub-allocate those dollars down to you, and whether or not Broward County will or will not, I know that's been something of a point of discussion, and so all the cities around the country and, and smaller counties have been calling for this. The Congress uh, in the HEROES Act, which was moved forward by the uh, speaker, would provide approximately almost a trillion with 500 billion going to states and the remainder coming down to local communities. So I think that's an opportunity. As you probably heard, Mayor, um, you know, that is the democratic proposal and uh, I don't have to tell you all that, um, you know, there's other positions. Uh, the Senate, um, as soon as that was issued, said, well, no, that's a Christmas tree of, of things and, and it's way beyond what we should be spending. However, in the Senate, both Senator Bill Cassidy, Republican of Louisiana, of course, he represents New Orleans, another uh, city that's impacted like Florida uh, by uh, you know, the drop in tourism, et cetera. And Bob Menendez out of New Jersey are calling, are putting forth what they call the smart bill, which would be 500 billion. That would also direct uh, a substantial amount for local communities. So I think that's an opportunity. If the ultimate dollar amount 
We shall see, especially because the president has been touting um, last week's job numbers in the stock market and those things. So that's number one. And that's a big push, not only by individual communities, but the national organizations, U.S. Conference of Mayors, National League of Cities. So I think it's important we push on that because obviously that would help you on your on your budget. And um, that's something I've talked to Mr. Kernow about and any any um, data that you all can provide me, updated data on your budget revenues. That's important. So that's number one. Of course, in the end, um, I'd be dishonest without telling you, you know, Congress talks about a lot of things and they put forth a lot of proposals and some of them uh, don't move forward or they don't move forward as fast as they, they can. But I do think there's a lot of there's a lot of sense of urgency about this. So that's number one. Number two, last week, the House Transportation Infrastructure uh, Committee put out what Mr. Kernow referenced before, the Invest uh, in America bill. It's a $500 billion transportation and infrastructure bill. This year, the Congress has to pass a surface transportation reauthorization bill. And that will be an opportunity to set forth some dollars for your transportation infrastructure. So I think that's another real opportunity. Again, here we are in a pandemic amidst uh, unprecedented protests, a presidential election. Um, so there are a few challenges. <laughs> so, uh, but that is another bill that is out there. And I will just say this, like I said, I, our firm, by the way, I didn't mention this earlier, we are not a partisan firm. Um, there are some, and uh, that is their choice, and sometimes it works well for them. We are a bipartisan firm, and so we feel that's an advantage for us all throughout our whole history. Um, no matter who's in power, we have divided government, um, you know, Republican Senate, Democratic House, the White House. So um, the president himself has spoken at least on a, a Oh, multiple occasions over the last three years that transportation and infrastructure is his sweet spot. So in an environment where the economy is right now trying to climb out of it, infrastructure dollars could stimulate it. And there's so much need. I don't have to tell you about this. Um, I know this is a long answer, but let me just finish this. I just want you all to know, I mean, Mr. Kernow talked about my bio and I am a Texan uh, by, uh, by birth. That's where I grew up, but I've always had longtime Florida connections. My grandfather uh, is originally a New York guy back in the 1950s, came down to Miami Beach. So I don't know if anybody who's a Dolphin fan in this crowd or not, but that was my team because of my grandfather. I've always been coming down to Florida. My parents had a second place for several years in Delray Beach. Don't hold that against them. Um, but a lot of family in, in Florida. And of course, I've been working on Florida issues for years. And so kind of circling back to this mayor, I've seen the transportation and traffic issues uh, that you guys contend with, which are so important just to get people to work, school, wherever. Transportation is is an opportunity. So uh, let me leave it at that. Great. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Curlin. Very nice to meet you. Welcome to the team. Thank you. Uh, anybody? Commissioner Simmons, Vice Mayor Carter. Any questions? Commissioner Simmons. No questions for me. No questions for me. Great. Thank you. Anybody? Good. You had you asked the right question. Great. Um, Mr. Mayor, can I go for a second? Please. Uh, Mr. Curlin, very nice to meet you. Um, I found the um, reports that are being generated for us to be very um, informative and uh, user friendly. They're not very lengthy, so I appreciate that. And then also. Um, you know, one of the things that caught my attention is the webinar because I'm in my first year. So the webinar uh, opportunities like the stormwater one that's coming up tomorrow, I'm gonna try to catch some of that, if not all of it. Um, these are types of things that as commissioners, I know we appreciate. And, you know, I just wanna thank the, the city staff and the commission. I, I believe it was unanimous when we voted to bring on a federal, federal lobbyist because you uh, and your firm have a lot to offer and it really gives us an opportunity to learn and grow and see how we can maximize our opportunity in the city. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, Mr. Perlin, is it true? There's Texas and then there's 49 other states. 
there, there is a lot of pride. Uh, <laughs> well, I, <laughs> I'm glad you're a Dolphins fan. Uh, I, I'm a Dolphins fan. And uh, every year I say, we'll get them next year. <laughs> well, I, I'll add this. Um, it's a lot easier, I think, to be a Dolphins fan than it is to be a Cowboys fan, even though <laughs> it's been tough. And um, so, you know, with Jerry Jones, uh, that ownership. But uh, anyway, a lot of pride. And I know Mr. Coach Shula recently passed. And, and I'm old enough to remember those teams from the early 70s. And, and of course, later Marino and all that. So uh, I just wanted to add, um, you know, as part of our team, uh, we've got a former member of Congress, uh, Skip Bafalis, and you, and you made me think of it, Mayor, because his son is a diehard <laughs> Dolphins fan. Uh, Congressman Bafalis represented, um, oh gosh, it was a district that went all the way from West Palm Beach all the way across the state. It goes back to from basically 1970 to 1980, when I think there was only 12 members of Congress from mm. the entire state of, of Florida. So he... He's so familiar with with uh, Florida. Of course, it's changed a lot, but uh, because he had such a huge um, congressional district, it was almost like a Senate seat. So he's still active. Um, I've been working with him very closely. And Hector Alcalde, just for your your purposes, uh, I think you might find this interesting. And the name Alcalde is a Spanish name. And believe it or not, it means mayor. And uh, so uh, Hector is our founder. Um, he started working in the city of Tampa for uh, a former congressman by the name of Sam Gibbons. And um, if you read the book by Tom Brokaw, uh, The Greatest Generation, there's a chapter in there about Mr. Gibbons, who was a World War II vet. So just a little bit about our firm. And um, I appreciate uh, the comments about our webinars, our other materials. We know you're getting a lot of information and we try to keep it um, try to boil it down, distill it down um, of our services. Um, I just want you all to know I am available to you. I provided my cell phone uh, number, my office number to um, all of you. Uh, we are available. Uh, we are providing our, our, we were providing on a daily basis these updates on COVID. Now that things have kind of slowed down a little bit, we're going back to our regular weekly. But should things change, we will we'll, we'll go back to a daily update. Um, as your other commissioner mentioned, we are providing we provide grant alerts on a weekly basis. When web, webinars come up, we think that's important. And uh, just other alerts. And right now, this is a busy time. I mean, I think this is a, uh, I mean, what can I say? <laughs> you all know you're dealing with it. <laughs> you just reminded me of something that's at least important to me. Uh, you said you're a bipartisan firm. You probably know we all run here nonpartisan. Uh, and most people that are not inside politicians uh, really don't know, I don't think, what parties we may be or may not be. Uh, but I'm very interested uh, to promote bipartisan legislation. So if you don't mind sharing, me, sharing with me, at least, if not with our team, when there are good examples of bipartisan legislation, you know, where the leaders of that legislation were from, you know, both sides. I think that's worthy of promoting it. We hear so much division and derision uh, in national politics that if there's some good news uh, that's uh, joint efforts, I would definitely love to hear about it. No, Mayor, we'll, um, you know, I think, I think there's been some, some, at least at the beginning of the COVID emergency, the first three bills, that came out with the big one being, you know, the multi-trillion dollar CARES Act. Those were bipartisan. I mean, they got support. I think everyone really realized, look, we have to put, um, I guess we have to put some water on the flames here. And, uh, and so at least for those first three bills, uh, there was a lot of consensus that, look, we have to do something. In fact, what was interesting, and I guess this is a little inside baseball switching sports, um, you know, here you have a Congress that normally convenes uh, all 435 members of the House, uh, the 100 senators. They're usually here. And here we are for the first time in the in the history of the Republic where basically the big four, um, Senator McConnell, Senator Schumer, uh, Kentucky and New York, and uh, Ms. Pelosi and, and Mr. McCarthy, the speaker and the and the minority leader from California, basically, they negotiated the big CARES Act 
and um, oh, passed it basically by, you know, um, acclamation, I guess you might call it. Uh, that doesn't happen too often, um, I think, at any level of government. And, um, you know, we, we understand that, um, you know, from your vantage point, you know, there, you hear a lot of this noise here in Washington. There is the divided government. Um, I think there's a big recognition that communities, cities, counties, you know, you guys are facing your constituents every day. And, uh, you know, I, I appreciate your, you're talking about bipartisanship or nonpartisanship. Um, I just mentioned that because, like I said, within our firm, we've got a range of views. But at the end of the day, um, and I'm taking a line out of one of my colleagues, you know, building a road or a bridge, it, you know, it, it, it's, it's not a it's not a you know, it's not a party issue. It's it's something you have to get done. So um, we're proud of that. We, we are proud of that. <laughs> but you're absolutely right. And, I, and as there's additional examples, which I hope there will be more, the transportation bill, believe it or not, Mayor, has historically been a bipartisan bill because everybody's got roads and bridges and buses and you got to move people. So, um, you know, that's been one. We'll, we shall see. Great. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Great. Thank you very much. Pleasure to meet you and look forward to talking to you in the future. And, and I will say this. I look forward to seeing you in person when I'm able and coming down to Florida. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marie. So next so, uh, on our agenda, Frank, is, oh, did you have something to add, Robert? Uh, no, I don't. I just wanted to remind you um, really quick that in your backup, you'll see the legislative priorities document that Maurice was talking about that has uh, the list of uh, items that I think align with our strategic priorities. And uh, Maurice, Maurice and I are in constant contact. So I'm here to answer any questions or if you have anything going forward, please let me know and I can forward them on to him. And uh, that's it. Thank you, Mayor. Let, let me uh, add Mr. Mayor, I have a question as well. Sure, Commissioner Simmons. All right, thank you. Uh, I read um, I read the backup, I read the legislative priorities, uh, obviously with the national conversation, um, you know, and I know that we have some requests in there or things we'd like to look at uh, regarding uh, regarding law enforcement. Um, I, would, I would like to, well, I would hope that our focus isn't necessarily on acquiring equipment, but funding um, that can be used more for community uh, service oriented uh, activities or anything that can help enhance um, the police department's um, uh, ability to continue to interact with the community. I think, um, I know some of the stuff in there, I think I saw something about juvenile justice and the, a certain program or something like that, but I want to make sure that we aren't focusing on just equipment unless it's absolutely critical to the function of the police department, but definitely looking for funding. And, and, and we may get better funding if it's, uh, you know, if we demonstrate that it's community service oriented, um, because I know sometimes, uh, that m the money that we get uh, from these, you know, state and federal grants are, are extremely uh, strict with where the money is supposed to be spent. So I hope that, you know, we kind of look at that and revise that a little bit um, to look for funding for more community service oriented programs and activities and services. Uh, even, even, uh, even if there's something we can do with, um, you know, mental health and social work services as well uh, through that. I, I actually second both of those emotions, Commissioner Simmons. I think those are excellent things that need to have priority from our city. Uh, and there's a great need on both ends. Uh, and the sooner we could apply, my guess, Mr. Curlin, is the better. Am I correct? Yes, I think that that is correct. Um, and uh, I will say this, a lot of the grants tend to be front loaded at the beginning of the year, um, whether they're part of the juvenile justice uh, division of the Department of, uh, Department of Justice, for example, and uh, where there are a lot, there are a number of grants that focus on, let's say, um, delinquency prevention, mentorship, um, reintegration into, into the community. Some of it's in the Department of Health and Human Services. And, um, and of course, in this environment, because of the COVID-19, there's been some supplemental dollars that we normally do not see that have been coming out. Um, it's mostly been on some equipment and PPE related stuff, admittedly, but certainly we will be on the lookout for what um, the commissioner has asked about. I think there's going to be even more discussion uh, because of this issue of policing, the the 
the bill that you all are hearing about that the, uh, was unveiled on Monday, this Policing and Justice Act, unfortunately, it does not include additional dollars. It is, it is kind of sets some requirements, uh, bans some practices, allows for greater accountability. But I do think there's going to be, uh, this is only the beginning of that discussion. And so certainly we can weigh in and we can look for uh, different opportunities. I will add this, that, you know, while we are a federal lobbying firm, we try to look at the whole universe of potential grants. And that could be uh, just through our grants division, looking at private foundation dollars. Um, if it happens to be state dollars that are coming from the feds, we want to let you all know about that. Um, we've had some, you know, we've taken a look at interesting things, just something that comes to mind, you know, I mean, obviously we're in such an unusual world now, but um, you know, with the, with so many kids playing soccer, for example, you know, you need a field and you need a ball, you know, um, you don't need as much other equipment. So, you know, one of the things we did a couple of years ago, one of our clients was interested in, hey, what else can we do for our kids? So this wasn't a federal grant. You know, we went and looked up the U.S. Soccer Foundation. You know, what are they doing? What are they providing? And, you know, we related to the community, left it to them to pursue it as just a, one idea. Um, recently, uh, another client of ours was talking about the Boys and Girls Clubs and uh, looking to see whether you know, certain members uh, had particular interest in that. And um, I just know that every community, I think, is really scrutinizing. How can we, how can we address these, uh, bringing the community together in different ways? So we will do that. And, um, you know, I really appreciate the question because if there's something on your mind as an individual uh, commissioner or mayor, um, you know, obviously you're conveying it through your city management, but, um, you know, it's just that kind of information it says, hey, wait a second, let's take a look here. It's not just the, the, the cut and dry stuff. I will add, uh, in addition, if there is opportunities in the future for travel, we'll see what happens. But um, we certainly welcome that and we encourage it for at least to come up to Washington once a year. Um, you know, we know your time is, is valuable. And if it's if you're able to do it budgetarily and otherwise, we do think that kind of just coming up here once a year, meeting with not so much even the members, but sometimes meeting with their staff and going to the federal agencies, it, as I like to say, it sometimes shakes the tree a little bit and you end up getting some direct information that, that um, just like I said, it's, it's more clear and more direct sometimes from, an, from a program, let's say Department of Transportation, we go to the Federal Highway Administration, or let's say we go to the EPA. Um, we've done this um, successfully, and sometimes uh, as a last uh, answer, and I know I've digressed uh, from what the commissioner was asking about, sometimes you're dealing with a issue of a permit or the way that an agency is wanting to deal with your grant. I happen to notice one of your recent newsletters, for example, the city secured, I think it was over $2 million for uh, economic development um, through the Department of Cam uh, Commerce. That's wonderful. Um, and, um, you know, sometimes, you know, they'll, they'll tie your hands uh, with how you want to use the money or set a kind of an unfair deadline or those types of things. So again, time is money, and we've been real successful in pushing to like resolve an agency issue that you're, you know, you're hitting it, your head against a wall with an agency that for whatever reason is, you know, giving you, you know, some bureaucratic obstacles. So that's another thing we do. We've we've um, we've been successful with that. We've gotten time extended, and sometimes that's really helpful because, you know, as we know, nobody expects things to happen these things that have happened and you're like, well, wait a second, you know, come on now, you guys have to give us some additional time. So those are just some other items I thought I might, I might mention, but if you, if you have plans to come up here, even just for vacation, when that opportunity comes, let me know. And we're glad to, to see you come to our office, arrange any meetings. Great. Thank you for the invitation. I appreciate but you. You, you may want to stay out of here for a while. <laughs> yeah. I think if we ask you another question, you may be here another half hour. So. <laughs> I'm sorry to, to be so lengthy. No, we we appreciate getting to know you. And uh, it's the first time I'm chatting with a federal lobbyist on behalf of the city. I think it's a great investment. Uh, I'm happy we've made it. And I look forward to a nice return. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much again, everyone. Great. And uh, Bob, thank you for your leadership with this as well. Appreciate it. You're very, very welcome, Mayor. Thank you. 
All right, Frank, over to you for the next item. So, Mayor, um, one of the, the things on everybody's mind, uh, amongst many things, uh, is what's going on with Cornerstone. Um, this is a project that's, that has been talked about for, for years, and um, we, we had some, some momentum moving forward, um, obviously, with COVID and in the, in the current economic environment. Um, a lot of the commission has been asking where are we at and what's next. So I've asked uh, Susie and, and, and Christy to give us an update as to where we are with Cornerstone and what we can expect to see in the near future. So I will turn it over to them for a quick update on Cornerstone. All right, I'm gonna start us off and then I will turn it over to Susie. Welcome, Christy. Thank you. Next slide, please. All right, so on June 1st, the CRA approved the collateral assignment of the TIF agreement that allowed them to get a $16.5 million investment in the project. Um, the consent agreement is uh, pretty normal. Um, and so the CRA didn't have any issue with that. Um, we're happy to see some money going into the project. Uh, Rod also announced that he has leased uh, 100,000 square feet to a medical group. And that's the office building that's gonna be on sample and university. Other updates that he provided was that the multifamily residential is right on target. The hotel deal is still in negotiation, but we're hoping for that to be finalized soon. And he also presented the option of an outdoor theater um, that Paragon has presented to him. He discussed a demolition schedule, which is going to be a 10 week process. And he also um, touched upon the, the fact that the project is going to be phased. And I think Susie's gonna go into a little bit more detail with that. Right. Thanks, Christy. The next slide. So we wanna be as transparent as possible with what's happening here with these changes because when we first brought it to you, it was really one phase and now there's five phases that they're proposing. And uh, the, the change in doing that from one to five is, is, is pretty, pretty big because the timing is gonna be so different than what we've originally thought. So in phase A, the reddish pink area there is where the 352 uh, apartments are going to be for uh, to be built at six stories there. The associated parking garage will go in there and the city right of way improvements to be handled by Mill Creek. Also the residential developer will be uh, done that, doing that as well. Phase B is the university drive phasing of the southbound turn lanes that are needed for this project along with FDOT's uh, university drive project that starts at Cardinal and goes south. And that includes uh, the master arms as well. They're estimated to start in the fourth quarter of 21. So the timing of these things happening before they get a CO is gonna be very close and we'll have to be watching that closely. Um, phase th uh, C then is the green piece. That is the hotel that Christy just mentioned is still being negotiated by Redesco uh, for 80 to 138 rooms. So that's still to be determined. Phase D in the darker blue above on the north side there is all being done by Predesco and is the medical office building that she just spoke of at the, uh, the east side of the, the, more towards the sample and university uh, area there with E being uh, actually in D, there's also the parking garage and the sample road area improvements there that just run right along sample road. Those, there's gonna be more turn lanes and more improvements put in there as well as part of phase D. Then E is the, the yellow piece that's the second office building that's approximately 100,000 square feet. So we've had a, a pre-application demolition permit that's been submitted and reviewed with comments by staff. Still working on that to finalize that and the de demolition will not be happening and in, you know, before the actual stipulated agreement that's in place right now that that deadline is actually July 31st. That deals with the maintenance of what's going on there. So in checking with them today, they verbally told us that the, the request will probably be to extend to the end of the year uh, to, for that to, to give them more time to be able to do it. And of course, you know, we're willing to do that given the, the unprecedented times that we're in and the delays that we're seeing because of that. Uh, but we may wanna look in, into that uh, agreement when we do extend it to have a little bit tighter control over what the property actually looks like because the maintenance that has been not as good as we'd like. We've you know, seen some of the things that happen with the landscaping or the building exterior and things like that that are part of the stipulated agreement. We want to work with them to try to see, even though it's still considered to be a temporary setup, it's been a long time. And I know people uh, are wanting to see the landscaping look better or the fencing along the outside. So some of those things we want to work with them, hopefully about during that uh, extension. If, you know, if the commission does approve this 
next uh, next week for your June 17th meeting, uh, we'd be looking to extend that to the end of the year more than likely then as they requested. So naturally we have a concern about starting with the apartments because you know, mixed uses, you wanna get those mixed uses going and starting with apartments is, is just really a, a concern, but uh, it is, it's because it's just, we don't know what's gonna follow that. I mean, we know what they're phasing and what they're saying and what they're doing, but we just wanna make sure that, uh, that everybody understands that this is a new phasing of everything. It's not happening all at once. And that being said, phase one does include uh, that the city right away uh, projects that go on. So that's, uh, go back to that color of the red. You start at university and go all the way down to 32nd court. That's, that's the perimeter. It goes west on 32nd. It can, extends up along uh, Skip, Am Skip Campbell Avenue. And also it will include the full uh, uh, development of the main street. So that helps a lot for us to, to understand that, uh, you know, they're, they are working on that infrastructure that's important to the overall project right off the get-go. It's not like they're waiting to do that later in another phase. They'll, Mill Creek will be responsible for doing that and getting that all done with us. Uh, Susie, can, can you talk a little bit about the timing between the phases uh, well, as what we, we understand it today? Yeah. Uh, well, what we were saying is Mill Creek is uh, the A, phase A there is uh, trying to get underway under construction by mid-fall. And the demolition would be just before that, obviously. So uh, that's that's what we know right now. That's what they're shooting for. They've got the demolition plans in that have been the pre-application for that being reviewed. They're finalizing that. But we do have to extend this uh, stipulated agreement between now and then because they won't be able to get everything done like the agreement calls for by the end of July. So that's why we need to do that. The University Drive improvements really are not going to come to the fourth quarter of 21. So that's B, that's later. And this, while this is the residence, I mean, the, the units are being built, that will be going on as well along there, but it's not gonna start until the quarter of 21. So it's gonna just like, they have to have COs on the units before that B can happen. Okay. They both have to be, I mean, we have to have the infrastructure in on University Drive in order to CO the building for the units. Is that clear? Did I say that? Okay. Yeah. And then so C. B, so B has to be completed before they get the COs. Yes, that's correct. And that will be really close because if they really start in October and if it takes 18 to 24 months, you're talking right in the same time frame as them starting up. Be close. C is the hotel, which we don't know yet. It's still being uh, negotiated, but it, you know, there is some promise there. And then D, of course, is uh, further down the line that we, we don't have a real serious commitment at this point. And you know they would like to start as soon as they can get everything uh, leased up, like they do have the medical group done. So the fir the first building will get going. Uh, I have not heard an, an exact time. Have you on that one, Christy? The timing of the of the first building. I have not. I know in the agreement that we have with them. Um, I'm just looking at it right now that this, they yeah, need the to CRA. obtain a building permit by January 30th of 2021, and they are supposed to receive their final CO by December 31st of 2022. There okay. is the ability to provide extensions, but that's up to the discretion of a CRA. Right. That's the CRA plan for that site, right? So then E is then after that. So that's, that's pretty much the summary of what I had to, to do. And I wanted actually uh, Julie Kerlak to be able to walk through the actual um, items that are being, that will be about the special exceptions that will be before you next week and then the city actions that follow from there. So Julie, you can take it over with the next slide. Yeah, next slide, please. Um, so on February 19th of this year, the commission approved a number of special exceptions for the project. I'm sure you all remember it. It was a, a great evening. Um, it, it was everything from the layout of Main Street to minimum and maximum block links, frontage zones, things like that for the project. Following that meeting on March 4th, you all approved the plat as well for the new layout of the lots. Um, it was then transmitted to Broward County and Broward County staff had a few, uh, few comments on the plat itself that then affected the maximum and minimum block lengths for the project. So although it's minimum, there's only about seven feet difference, that minimum amount that you all approved is changing a little bit. So that's what um, Susie mentioned will be coming before you on June 17th. It'll be a special exception modification. 
in addition to that particular special exception that you'll be considering the change to, as Susie mentioned, based on the new phasing plan, there's a number of conditions that were tied to different timing for the project. Since it was originally one phase, it was, you know, these rights away improvements had to happen before this building permit or this had to happen before the CO. So we're going to be tweaking a few of those uh, conditions as well. And that'll be on that agenda item for you to consider that night. Uh, next slide, please. Um, from there, should you approve that modification next week, the applicant will then be resubmitting for site plan sign off. We're almost there. Just a few more things they needed to tweak on the site plan. Hopefully we can sign off and have that done. It'll be, it'll be really great to have that uh, um, all done. So um, from there, they, there's a few other <clears throat> items such as a dedication of easement for the sanitary sewer, which they've submitted for. You'll probably see that July or August as well as a few different agreements for the rights away improvements. Um, which we've mentioned to you previously, as well as hopefully by you know the end of the year or so, they'll have signed a few more of those tenants. They'll have a better idea of what kind of signage they're gonna want for the program, uh, for the project, and we'll be able to bring you a master signage program. And that concludes our presentation. Great, uh, thank you very much. So if we could get an email where the estimated timeframes are for the five phases, I would appreciate that. Any questions, Commissioner Sarah? I uh, have a question, thank you. Um, and uh, Susie, this goes to you, I guess. Uh, as far as the phases, um, with the restaurants and the retail, I'm assuming that would be after phase four at best case scenario, or would that be after phase five? Because phase four with the garage, I'm assuming that's a key component in delivering um, the restaurants and the retail. Yeah, uh, the, the well, they're going to be um, on the north side. You're talking about the north side with that that garage. Yes. Yes, that would be in the fourth phase. That's when okay. we would start seeing re restaurants, unless something changes. At the conclusion of phase four, right? Yes. And so after, it's, after the office building is built, and yeah, but the main street itself will be set up. It you know in in between there that will be done. All right, so like with the delivery of phase four, would that mean that um, that area would be accessible to our residents despite the fact that phase five is under construction or do we have to wait until everything is done? I'm assuming we could open up phase four and that would be available to everyone in a safe and efficient way. Yes, yes, we don't have to wait for five to happen for four to be available. Okay, so up until the conclusion of phase four, it would be more or less a residential office area as well as um, gas for the hotel portion of the parcel land. As it's planned right now, yes. Okay. And then the last question I have is, is that's the year phase four being 2022 best case scenario? Um, I think Probably. Uh, that's hard to say, but uh, I mean, they're hoping to get going faster than that, you know, but I just, sure. I don't know that we could. So I think that's realistic. Commissioner, okay. the one thing I believe they, they've said is, is if for some reason they got a rush or a need for that space, they would obviously want to move up the construction. Um, so we, we just don't know what that's going to bring. This is what they're presenting at this time, but it could be moved up if they were able to lease the space out. Right. Okay. Thank you. Gotcha. Anybody else? Vice Mayor Carter. So I just looking for clarification. So phase A is the residential component. And then everything else is going to go up after that. So they're going to live through all this construction constantly. And there's no restaurants or anything until the very end. Well, we're saying uh, phase four for the restaurants, not the fifth, but the fourth. Okay. So not the very end. <laughs> yes, Vice Mayor, there, there, the, if, if, if the residential, so if the construction started prior to the residential being completed, then they wouldn't have to live through the whole construction process. But there is a chance that the construction on the residential could be substantially completed before some of these other phases are started. And then you're correct in, in saying that those residents would be uh, um, exposed to or subject to that construction. 
Yeah, not not ideal, but obviously we're not in ideal times by any means. Right. I would definitely like us to uh, come up with some kind of strategy that we can enroll and empower the community to support us with, you know, this downtown project. <laughs> so I would definitely love to get input, you know, uh, from a couple of our committees, their ideas, you know, so you can see, you know, we're like, uh, even <laughs> yesterday when I was asked the question during the team political forum, again, thank you, Larry, for your leadership all these years with that. Such a great way to engage the youth. Um, you know, they asked me and I was kind of hopeful that we wouldn't hear about a delay, but obviously, yes, I anticipated that was the likelihood. Uh, so I definitely want to enroll the public to joining us in this process, pivoting, being agile, because if there, if we can continue positive momentum, especially through this, I think that would be very helpful and, and maybe project, you know, help, help the fulfillment of these phases a little bit quicker with greater confidence. So we, we want to be the champions for Cornerstone. Uh, I, I think I speak for all five of us. We'd like to be that. So, uh, Commissioner Vignola, any thoughts or comments? I'm good, Mayor. Thank you. Great. Great. Anybody else? All right. Commissioner Simmons, you're good. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so what I'd also ask, uh, from the team is, as you hear of new developments like that are, I don't know, newsworthy potentially one way or the other, if you can send us a quick text like we often get uh, with emergencies, uh, I definitely don't want to hear, you know, from Coral Springs talk something that I haven't learned before. And that recently happened with uh, Trader Joe's. So as you know things, if you can share it with the five of us, I'd appreciate it. So, Mayor, um, uh, just on that note, uh, we do have to understand that sometimes we're told stuff from developers and we have an agreement with them that we have to be confidential with their information. And somehow that information gets out outside of city staff. So just uh, just to be understanding of, of those incidents are going to happen where we're going to give a, a developer our word that we're going to keep their information confidential as they've asked us to. Um, and, uh, you know, we may, we may or may not be able to share it with, uh, with anybody outside of Christie's office sometimes, but, uh, we, we, we do our best to keep the commission as informed as possible. I am just understood. And you do, uh, you Lynn, everybody, uh, police and fire, you really keep us informed on a very timely basis all the time. So not, not meant to be a criticism, just an invitation. And this is also COVID time. So. A lot of things are imperfect. Uh, and well, you guys get compliments all the time, but you're handling this with such agility. It's awesome. You know, thank you. So uh, next on the agenda, what do you have, Frank? So Mayor, the next on our agenda is emergency communication services. Um, this is a very long uh, process that we've been involved with. Um, this goes back, um, actually to 2006 time frame when some discussions had originally taken place uh, between Coral Springs and uh, Parkland and, and Margate Coconut Creek. Um, but this most recent one uh, kind of came up in, in late, uh, I would say 2017, where when I was a fire chief, I was reached out to by the city manager for Margate asking if we would be willing to take on a, a partnership with them to do a four city fire department. Um, during those discussions, uh, it came up uh, with communications if we'd be willing to add the police communications into that four city fire department uh, talks. There was a ton of work that was done by staff, um, both uh, for, for all four cities, I would say in trying to uh, get this proposal together. As the proposals uh, you know, started to be developed, um, the fire department conversation uh, kind of uh, stalled and uh, kind of took a back seat 
um, and the communications conversation stayed at the forefront. Um, we were asked to do a proposal for just communications for police and fire for Coconut Creek and Margate. Uh, so we started working on those proposals. We did all the due diligence. Uh, we checked our, our um, technology requirements, our radio systems, our spacing requirements. Uh, again, a ton of work went into this by a lot of different departments uh, throughout uh, the cities involved. About, uh, I would say 80% of the way through that process, um, there was some conversation by Margate of, of uh, not sure if they can, wanted to continue with that scope and that proposal. So Coconut Creek came to us and said, would you be willing and can you provide communication services if it was just for Coconut Creek? And the answer was no, we cannot because we would not provide services for just the Coconut Creek Police Department. And the reason for that is we do not want to, as a city, we do not want to contribute to uh, any issues when it comes to transferring calls for service. Um, if anything that we do, we want to make sure we're doing it towards the betterment of services to a higher level of services to whatever communities we serve in whatever capacity. So then Mark, uh, Coconut Creek came back to us and said, well, if we had our own fire department and there was no need to have two different dispatch centers for police and fire, would you do a communication services in that case? And the answer was yes, uh, being that we did not have to separate out law enforcement and fire rescue. Uh, and uh, we, we had the proper technology in place, then we would, we would, we would consider doing that. Um, so the biggest stipulation here for this was the proper technology has to be in place in order to start an emergency response to a caller without having to transfer that call. And what that means is I don't care where you are, in Broward County and, and, and hopefully someday in Palm Beach County on the border, because we do border Palm Beach County with our service areas. If you dial 911 and you come to our dispatch center and we don't service police or fire, we will be able to at least start that response for you without having to transfer the call. Um, we know that this was a point of, of, of interest uh, during the Douglas um, tragedy that took place and it's something we took to heart and we committed as a city that we would work very hard to solve that issue and we have we have purchased a hub which is basically a solution that joins cad systems together and i don't want to get into a very lengthy technical conversation here but basically the way it works is it takes um CADs that are disparate. There are different types of CADs and it allows them to communicate with each other. The CAD is the technology that dispatches or makes the recommendation for dispatching the units that are going to respond to emergency calls. So when we talked to both Coconut Creek and Margate, we told them that we would not do this service until we had that um, piece of technology in place. It was tested and it was up and working. And uh, I, uh, during Kathy's presentation, she'll touch on that, but that uh, is expected to be, by the end of the year, is expected to be in the testing phase. Um, and then to go on with that, uh, there had to be some other stuff that Kathy will, or will, will cover during her presentation. I just wanted the commission to have uh, the history here. Uh, this has been a over a three-year process, um, and it started out as a much larger uh, project and is now down to uh, uh, um, um, the project at hand. Uh, I have not gotten an official request from the city of Margate as of yet, but um, I have had uh, an unofficial uh, uh, conversation, if you will, if we would still be interested in, in, in doing dispatch services for Margate. And the answer is, is, is if I get that official request, we, we've already done the legwork. The, the, the proposal was completely done. The mapping was done. The run cards were, I mean, we, it was done. The, the only thing we had left to do was the agreement. So we, we certainly would look at that if, if Margate came to us and officially and asked us to, to look at it again, which to this point that has not happened. Um, so uh, 
this also uh, affects the city of Parkland. Obviously we do their dispatch for the fire because we are their fire department. So with that overview, that's a very high level overview. I could spend two hours giving you the history of this without repeating a word. So I wanted to give you that very high level history of, of what's going on. Kathy will go through the presentation. I believe she'll have some help in, in a couple different areas with IT and so forth. And then afterwards, we're happy to answer any questions the commission may have. Kathy? Um, Mayor, actually, Mayor, before we begin, um, as uh, City Manager said, this has been a very long process. And uh, uh, during this process, um, Commissioner Vignola became employed at, at the manager's office at the City of Margate. So as, as this commission is always great, great about, we have those conversations about whether or not anything would be a conflict. And I had this conversation several times with Commissioner Vignola, Vignola as this process has changed and moved forward and, and so forth. So. Um, What's in front of you today, Frank told you, which is this um, expanded dispatch uh, issue at Coconut Creek. Uh, Margate has been involved in the conversations over the several months with Commissioner Vignola. Commissioner Vignola has, uh, in more than abundance of caution, been very careful not to be participant in the Margate discussions that, uh, as his role here as a commissioner. But um, despite any of that, uh, tonight, Commissioner Vignola asked me this several weeks ago, and as, as we got closer, asked me this as well. So there is no conflict at all for Commissioner Vignola to speak about this. There will be no conflict at all for Commissioner Vignola if and when it comes to time to vote on this issue. We've looked at it under several uh, um, uh, statutes, 112.313, standards of conduct for public officers, and also involving doing business with one owns agency, as Commissioner Vignola is also employed, as, as we said, and also uh, with Margate and, and voting conflicts under 112.3143. And in addition, it have even had a uh, conversation with the Commission on Ethics on this. So just so every, because um, Commissioner Vignola is, is very uh, um, careful as, as this entire commission is, and I appreciate all of you for that. Uh, we have worked together on this. And so wanted to make sure that everyone has that comfort level that this conversation uh, it would not be in conflict in any way for the commissioner. So thank you, Mayor. Great, hey. appreciate that you sharing that with us. Thank you very much, John. In mayor and commission before Kathy starts, um, the reason we're doing this presentation is to bring you up to speed as to where we are. And we're looking for direction from the commission as to if we should continue to move forward with this project and if we should bring an ILA forward to the commission for a vote. Uh, the city of Coconut Creek has voted on this and has has voted in favor of having us do their dispatch services. However, I did commu communicate to the city manager of Coconut Creek, Karen Brooks, that I still have not brought this to the commission in a workshop format. And that would be done first and foremost. And if tonight the commission gives us direction to move forward, we will get uh, together uh, a submission to put in the appropriate paperwork to bring it to a commission for a formal to a commission meeting for a formal vote. Kathy, That's all good. yours. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Commissioners. I'm just going to go over the presentation to go over the emergency communication services that we would be uh, providing to the city of Coconut Creek. Next slide, please. So we're gonna go over a little bit of introduction on our communication center. Um, also the details, um, uh, high level details of the expansion, what it will take for staffing. Um, also our processes for quality assurance to make sure that we keep our level of service um, to the standards that we currently have. Uh, also the training that will go into play, our current radio coverage and how it would be affected by bringing on um, Coconut Creek the logistics of going live and also just a high level overview of the whole project. So as some of you may or may not know, our communication center, our public safety answering point consists of 38 highly trained communications professionals. Um, Coral Springs PSAP along with the police as a police department for law and communications, we are accredited through CALEA. Uh, we received our accreditation in 2007 as a communication center, and we earned the uh, accreditation with excellence in 2013 and 2016. And we were the first to receive the excellence with law and communications through CALEA. 
Uh, so very, we're very proud of that accomplishment. And right now we're currently in the process of reaccreditation for both law and communications, and it should be completed hopefully by the end of summer of this summer 2020. So the software that we're using, and I think that's attracting um, Coconut Creek to um, inquire for emergency communication services with the city of Coral Springs is first off is our Motorola P25 digital radio system that we went live on that system um, in 2015. We also have the enhanced 911 system that includes the text to 911 that's countywide. Uh, with our radio system, we also have automatic vehicle location with GPS. And one of the uh, things that we have with our GPS is on the handheld radios that public safety have for law enforcement officers, we are able to um, track where they are in case there's a, any um, situation where they're in trouble. This is refreshes for us on a live basis that we're able to locate where the officers may be if they're in a situation that they need our assistance. Uh, for fire, we actually are able to put it on the apparatus itself so we can actually track uh, the apparatus in case um, something were to happen to it. We recently went through a major renovation in the communication center where we changed, um, updated all our electrical and we also updated our workstations which are ergonomical uh, consoles which help especially with um, the dispatchers being in, a, in the dispatch center for a long period of time. And then we have our Central Square OSSI computer aided dispatch system, which we use uh, to enter calls for service. So I know that City Manager Ravenick had spoken about the EDC hub. So we did purchase the EDC hub as, um, uh, as a city. So right now we're in the process of implementing that. And we're right now, the tentative completion date is November of 2020. Um, COVID kind of put a little wrinkle on the starting, but we did have our project kickoff and we're moving ahead um, with the vendors uh, to go ahead and start this process. So by doing this EDC hub, um, like Chief Babinick or City Manager Babinick mentioned, it will allow for the reductions of 911 transfers during high priority calls. Uh, the system will allow us to put in a call for service and avoid those, tr those transfers for us to initiate those calls for neighboring jurisdictions. So just a picture of, of what our new center, our center looks like now that it's been updated, um, just so you have an overview of what it looks like. And then later on, I'll show you where uh, we have the real estate to add where Coconut Creek would be housed. So and when we started this whole venture, our biggest um, effort was to make sure that we would be providing Coconut Creek with the highest uh, level of emergency communication services. We want to be able to deliver the high quality service that our citizens are experiencing with us for Coral Springs and for Parkland for uh, fire rescue services. So our goal is to be, deliver that high quality service to the residents and visitors for both the police and fire department. And Coral Springs as a PSAP, we are committed to becoming that vital link um, just as a neighboring jurisdiction with Coconut Creek, um, integrating the emergency services with a neighboring jurisdiction is really a, a, a great benefit for us to be able to provide um, the best service possible. Next slide. I know um, City Manager Bavanek talked about the, I guess, the sequence of events of how we have come to where we are today in presenting this um, during this workshop. So. Back in January in 2018 was when the, the discussions had begun officially um, in reference to the joint venture of fire EMS services um, with Coral Springs um, and Coconut Creek, Margate and Parkland. Um, they approached us like uh, the city manager said at the end of 2017, um, but the official discussion started there. In June of 2018, um, IAFF Local 3080 submitted their level their letter of non-support for the regional fire service, so that um, got put in the back burner. Uh, however, Coconut Creek and Margate still were interested in receiving um, some sort of a presentation on how we would present um, for communications for both police and fire EMS. And uh, it was a long process. Uh, we did um, get input from um, 
a company to help us do a report to see how would what what exactly would it entail, see what their calls for service were, um, and so forth to be able to provide them an a, an accurate estimate. Um, then in November of 2019, between Coconut Creek and uh, Margate, we did finalize a dispatch ILA for both police and fire EMS. Um, but then in January 2020, uh, Coconut Creek presented to their commission approving the ILA um, with Margate. But at that point, Margate was not prepared to present it um, on their agenda without um, a long-term commitment for their fire EMS services. Um, and then in May of 2020, Coconut Creek Commission approved the amended police and fire EMS dispatch ILA with Coral Springs that did not include Margate because they still wanted to continue the conversations. Next slide. So the expansion for it to include to add Cocon the city of Coconut Creek for dispatch services for both police and fire, it is um, it does take a lot of work to try to decide what exactly it is that the city of Coconut Creek is looking for and what are we able to provide to them um, and be able to commit to. So we'll start with the police side uh, of it. First with police, they would like their own police main channel. Um, so just like right now with uh, Coral Springs, they we have our own police channel that our police officers are able to talk through and then Coconut Creek would have the same. Then there'll be a teletype information channel, which that's where they will be querying um, anytime they, they make a traffic stop or um, going out with any subject or anything like that. This is where they go or any tow request. They basically go through the teletype information channel. Then we will have for the police side, a backup tactical channel. That's if they're working any major incident. So it doesn't tie up their main uh, police channel. They're able to uh, have the officers that are part of that event switch over and handle that. So we would have someone assigned to that. There would be an additional supervisor position that'll be shared by all cities. We currently have one supervisor position now. Um, although we have two supervisors a shift, we have one supervisor console. So this would allow us to have a secondary uh, supervisor position. Next slide. And then for fire, it's a completely different setup just because fire works a little bit different than police does in a sense of uh, mutual and automatic aid. So for fire channel, we would the fire departments prefer to have um, one main channel uh, to, that it will be responsible for dispatching the units. But however, they will have a fire tactical channel that with this, it'll allow um, certain predetermined call types, uh, for example, um, two, two or more apparatuses responding to a certain call for service would switch over to a tactical channel. And then a tactical dispatcher would be responsible for continuing the call for service. Um, by having them all be originally dispatched on that one main channel, it gives situational awareness to all the units in the area um, for closest unit. Um, also the Coral Springs Peace app will like I said, dispatch the original call for service. And then with our CAD, it will allow us to initiate the closest unit for mutual and automatic aid, um, not only with our CAD, but it also be accomplished with the EDC hub that I had mentioned originally in one of the previous slides. Next slide. So I had showed you the um, other picture of the our center and this back area is the area for expansion. Um, it kind of is complete, doesn't match the rest, but that's the open area that we have. Uh, we would get rid of all that's there and um, part of the quote that we presented to or cost that we gave to Coconut Creek includes um, putting the proper furnishings and connectivity technologically to be able to service them in this open space that we have available. So for staffing, um, right now, we would be, um, we ha always have a shift supervisor on duty 24 seven, at least we have a minimum of one for um, corals to service Coral Springs and Parklands for uh, fire EMS. Um, with this venture, we would be having a minimum of two shift supervisors on duty 24 uh, seven to be able to handle the um, any concerns or any questions that the staff may have, uh, they'll be able to be able to, they will be able to be there to be able to answer the questions, um, any requests that come from any 
uh, road supervisor that will be able to handle those requests. Um, the Coral Springs Police will, with uh, our HR department at the Public Safety Building will be the one conducting the recruitment process of adding the additional staff members. Um, and based on the Omnicon consultant report, the staffing that would best suit their volume of calls for service, because we did um, look into all that information that, they, that the city of Coconut Creek provided to us, it would require us to have an, an additional three communication shift, shift supervisors. We currently have um, six for us, so we would add three more, so it's a total of nine. We would um, have an additional 15 public safety telecommunicators. Uh, we would uh, need an IT programmer analyst uh, to be able to service um, through uh, Steven's team, and then also an HR support specialist to be able to handle uh, the addition of the positions uh, plus the current staffing that we have. And one note is that I, public safety telecommunicators of uh, the role of it, they, they do dual role of all, not only answering the phones, but they also have the role of dispatching um, the calls for service. Um, so they are cross-trained to be able to do both, which is a benefit. Kathy, if I can interrupt you just for a moment. Absolutely. The uh, 15 public safety telecommunicators would be supervised by the three shift supervisors? Yes, plus the six that we already have on staff. Gotcha. It'll be a total okay. of nine. All right, thank you. No problem. Next slide. So with quality assurance, for us, quality assurance um, is really a big deal because this is how we're, we keep the quality assurance in-house. There's many different vendors that come and ask us, hey, we would love to do your quality assurance, but we feel that by doing this internally, we're able to uh, make sure that certain guidelines are being met. Also uh, with our accreditation standards, the requirements are also met. Um, our EMD standards are met um, just because we're working with Dr. Antevi, who's our medical director. Um, we QA our CPR calls, making sure that we are staying with the, you know, above the, the, the standard for the national level, um, which we've been able to, you know, improve significantly. So we do a minimum of four calls that are QA'd per staff member. Uh, another thing that we do is customer service surveys where we have um, a certain amount of um, employees here, team members that are assigned to make outbound calls. So a minimum of seven random calls are chosen each month and we have a list of questions that we ask of how was uh, the service that we provided? Is there anything that we can do better? Um, so those are, have always been very positive to be able to interact with the callers after uh, the event of why they called us. So we do that and we would be continuing to do that for the city of Coconut Creek if we would do this venture. So training, um, training is, is for me, very important uh, to be able to provide the level of service that we want to provide to the city of Coconut Creek. Uh, internally now with just our staff alone, training is a big portion of the hiring process, making sure people are ready to uh, man the radios. Our, our training program is an extensive and a lot of times we tell our new hires that it's almost like going back to school or going back to take a college course because it can take uh, six months to get off of training just because it's it's an intricate uh, level of training. Uh, you're learning a new language, sort of say, with signals and codes um, and learning the geography of the city. So that's something that we would be working with Coconut Creek Police and Coconut Creek Fire Command staff to establish the expectations that they have from us um, and also what, what we are already providing and what they've seen so far, uh, especially with our stan standard operating procedures there, um, they like our trajectory and how we, we do business as a PSAP. Um, and the way that we start our training, we do start a training academy. It's a classroom is a setting and then they transition to a live environment. And the reason we do that is because we don't expect them to just sit down and know everything as soon as they sit down. And like I said, it's a new language that they have to learn, um, speaking with uh, the public over the phone um, and you know different scenarios that come. Because a lot of times when they're calling 911, it's not because they had a good day. It's usually during a very stressful um, event. So we have to train um, our people prior to 
so they can um, be able to transition to the live environment and to the final phases of the training. Next slide. So what does the training entail for all trainees? And this is also what we currently expect from our trainees for the Coral Springs um, Police and Coral Springs Parkland Fire Department. Well, it's an extreme uh, geography orientation. Uh, we actually go and do um, scavenger hunts of our city. So we will be expanding that to include the city of Coconut Creek. Um, we go out there and we take an old map because most people like to use their GPS on the phone. I'm, I'm guilty of that. However, they have to know how to use a real live map. And you know they'll tell the trainer, hey, the trainer will ask them, how do I get to this address? And they have to figure it out um, if they are not familiar with the area. So that has been a benefit to a lot of the trainees because most younger people that are coming into the workforce do not know how to use a map. Um, we also like to do um, ride-alongs with both police and fire. Um, not only does it help for zone familiarization, but it also helps with building that relationship uh, with the, vo the other voice that they hear on the other side of the radio. Um, and gets to, uh, for our people to, uh, our staff in the PSAP to be able to know um, the main landmarks of Coconut Creek. There's some, a lot of times where uh, some people know like, the Darth Vader building off of university. That's what some people may know it as, but it may, it's, it's a different one now. So it, it, we just like to make sure that, you know, someone that has been in the city for 20, 30 years may call it one thing. And there, and then the CAD and how we provision it, it's gonna be something different. So it's very important to establish those relationships early. Uh, learning incident types, learning the, the, the computer system that's very intricate. Um, we, they do have to learn how to use that because it, it helps them to not only, if they don't enter the proper information in there, it'll delay the response. So it's very important how they enter the call for service. Um, the language, like I said, the 10 codes, uh, status codes, and then there is a, a requirement of 232 hours of hands-on training that's required by the Department of Health uh, for the certification of a 911 public safety telecommunicator. Next slide. So all staff members are required to obtain and renew the following certifications. First is the emergency medical dispatch certification through APCO that is uh, vouched by our medical director, Dr. Antevi. Um, that is where we're able to give uh, medical direction over the phone until the first responders gets on scene. Uh, we're also required to have a CPR certification. Uh, we have the public safety telecommunicator certification with APCO. We have our FEMA training, HAZMAT, and like I stated, the 911 Public Safety Telecommunicator Certification with the Florida Department of Health. And one good thing that we're very proud of is to have designated SWAT and tactical dispatchers. Uh, so we have our experienced um, that have tenured dispatchers that have been here for a long time and worked specific incidents. Uh, we have an additional assignment within the unit that they're able to go out on SWAT calls, they respond with our command bus uh, to be able to help um, during a high stress incident. And we will also be expanding our tactical uh, dispatcher group to include the fire um, tactical side of that, be just because uh, as we expand on dispatching for the fire side, um, we would be getting you know more calls for service. And it's very important to, to also have specific tactical for fire as well. So our radio coverage, if you look at the mapping on there, it shows the uh, what's outlined in the black is our city, including um, the city of Parkland of where our radio coverage. If you look at the little blue dots, that's where our radio towers are located. So they're microwave dishes, so they just they bounce off of each other to uh, create better coverage. So all that green area is how it is our radio coverage that we have. So if you look at where we're located and if you see how much green area we have, it, it, it goes beyond, you know, our city. It goes into, you know, Palm Beach all the way close to the, the water by the beach into the Everglades. So our reception, our radio coverage is very impressive. And we did a you know, good job on doing that when we got our radio system. And with that, we made sure that with the radio system that we had the capability to do GPS at a real time 
uh, for location for first responders. Um, there are some systems that, you know, you can only do it with when the officers push on, uh, on the actual uh, radio, and that's when the GPS is provided. The, ours is constantly refreshing to provide the first responder location. Um, and with our new system, we have 83 talk groups. And on a day-to-day -day basis, we are anywhere from 18 to 19% of that. And then, you know, our towers that we have that are highlighted in blue, we have ours in the public safety building in Coral Springs. We have one in Margate and we actually have one in Coconut Creek. Um, so by adding the city of Coconut Creek there, you know, in the cost, we also put how, how it would affect us and to keep our, our radio system capacity at what we have it today at the 18 to 90%. And we will be able to accomplish that um, you know, with costs that we have provided to the city of Coconut Creek. Next slide. So logistics for going live. Um, the logistics, I guess, is the more complex part. Um, we have uh, myself with um, Stephen Dyer and his team, uh, but working with um, city of Coconut Creek and other staff members on finance and everything on how, what would it take for us to go live? Um, because our biggest goal is to be able to have enough lead time to program. We want to test and test and test to make sure that everything as, goes as seamless as possible. We want to make sure our staff is trained to be able to make the transition as seamless as possible. So the conceptual design for the network connectivity and security, which uh, for both the city of Coconut Creek and the city of Coral Springs, uh, both IT directors are mutually agreed upon it, and their number one goal is to make sure that our city security network is not compromised at all by this venture. And that's where Stephen and his team have worked very hard to make sure that the design that, that was agreed upon would not uh, put us in any predicament to, to jeopardize that. Um, we would also have to build a new CAD environment to be able to support um, the multiple agencies. We would be keeping the same system, but we would just have to do a new environment to support adding the additional um, jurisdictions. Next slide, please. Um, so part of the secured network connection between both cities, that includes installing fiber optic cables, routers, and firewalls between the cities which is vital because you know, with having both law enforcement agencies, we wanna remain compliant with FDLE and CGIS. And CGIS. Um, you know, we just had our technical audit last year, uh, which we passed with flying colors and not every jurisdiction can say that. Um, and the reason why is because we have such a great relationship with our IT department to make sure that our, our um, connection is um, is, is as secure as possible and that we're upholding the, the, the standards that FDLE and CGIS expects of us. Um, additionally, we would be implementing additional cybersecurity measures because we want to mitigate any risks um, that the, this venture can possibly have. And then on the CAD system side, we would have to provision. Um, our GIS team would be very involved um, with the mapping. Um, this our map has Coral Springs and Parkland. We would just be adding the city of Coconut Creek and that'll help us uh, by adding the mapping uh, with a GIS would help us for um, closest unit response um, for the fire side. So that'll be very helpful. Um, it'll include the codes and response plans that it will take place for both police and fire. And our CAD system would also need to communicate with the record management systems for the city of Coconut Creek for both police and fire and then also communicate to the station alerting for the city of Coconut Creek, just like it does for our city. So the hiring and training of personnel for this expansion is 24 months is gonna be needed to hire and train. Uh, the way that um, we came up with the structure, there, it's going to be um, an, an escalated phase on how we hire for public safety telecommunicators. Um, we do need um, ahead of time the IT programmer analyst and the HR um, specialist to be able to um, help us with the venture. Um, but overall, when it comes to the employees for the actual PSAP, we will be doing um, academies with up to six people and slowly um, do uh, the training that way. 
And once we get the people hired, we will also be able, with the additional staff, be able to train our current uh, employees to be able to, you know, become more comfortable with the ge geography in the city of Coconut Creek um, to be able to better service them over there. Um, expansion of our radio equipment, like I said, when I was presenting about our radio system, um, we will be working with our vendor Motorola to expand the radio equipment. And that venture takes about three to four months for them to complete. And then um, in that back area where I showed you that empty space that we have, we would have the additional console furniture and any renovations that we that would need to be done. That takes about four months to complete. Kathy, uh, Commissioner Vignola has a question for you. Go ahead. Kathy, um, so we're going to be training our employees to learn the geography of Coconut Creek then? Yes, we will be doing that just because I feel that um, if anything were to happen, any big scale event, I want all employees to be comfortable. Um, if a large scale incident were to happen again, um, you know, we have, have been a part of it with MSD, having everyone, you know, cross trained to know both cities is a benefit to all. Um, it gives us a uh, better coverage in the room. It gives us the availability to a major incident. Even if it's a large structure fire, multiple alarms, we're able to get more resources with our dispatchers um, and be able to assist the newer dispatchers that are coming on. It's, it's, it's vital just since we have training officers here that are, many of them are our SWAT and tactical dispatchers and they are in those positions just because of the complexity of calls they have taken and it'll definitely benefit us all um, during the process. Great, thank you, Kathy. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, the unifying of the emergency communications between Coral Springs and Coconut Creek. Um, one of the biggest benefits is the closest unit dispatching for all public safety disciplines. We will be in the same room um, and be able to know uh, what is going on in, in our surroundings, what's going on in Coconut Creek that uh, we may be able to send um, Coral Spring units to assist and vice versa with Coconut Creek, uh, since we have such a good relationship um, with our neighboring city, uh, that we'll be able to expand that um, on, the, on the communications level. Uh, providing the automatic aid for fire rescue services is such a huge benefit um, for us. We, we have, um, with automatic aid, right now we, have, we can build it in the CAD, and, and by doing so, we can automatically dispatch the, these agencies for, for services that they may need. We can program specific nature codes um, for structure fires, for active shooter incidents that automatically, hey, we're going to need those additional resources to help us. And we can have that already built in the back end to provide the automatic aid for those. And obviously, the efficient pro call processing, you know, making sure that the integration of the the call in progress is done. Uh, one of the things that is vital to us is the call processing and dispatch time because for us, time equals life. And one of the things that we do in the Coral Springs PSEP is as soon as we have an address and what is going on, that call is automatically being dispatched as the call taker is still questioning the caller and we're obtaining additional information because at least we already have the wheels on the ground going to the call. And as, as the call progresses, we will be updating the officers um, on what's going on uh, with the situation, but at least we have uh, units going instead of having to wait till we complete the entire call for service to be able to provide them that information. So for us, time equals lives and, and the call processing and dispatch times that we are able to provide to for Coral Springs residents um, and visitors and for the city of Parkland for fire rescue and EMS is vital to us. Kathy, before you move off this slide, I just want to touch on one quick thing. Closest unit response dispatching is something that has to happen either way. So whether we do something with Coconut Creek or not, uh, we have to be part of the closest unit response dispatching protocol for fire rescue services. Um, there are fire and EMS services throughout the county that are in phase one of this. And, uh, and they are, they are uh, expecting to roll out phase two towards the end of the year. We'll be towards the latter end of it um, because we have to make sure our technology works together. So that's why we bought the hub. We did not buy the hub um, specific to this project. 
we bought the hub to to be able to achieve closest unit dispatching. However, the hub does allow us to do many other things. Thank you for that. Thank you. And there's one more slide. Thanks. So our ultimate goals are first responder safety is one of our top priorities. The ability to check the welfare, the welfare of our public safety personnel, um, not only with the GPS locations, but that, that'll help us tremendously with the mapping and being able to track the units, um, but also with you know any specific protocols that the agency wants, just like we have for our officers and our paramedics, um, where our police officers, we check on them every so often, depending on um, how the command staff wants that done. And same with our fire units. If they've been on a call for so long, we check on their welfare to make sure that they're okay. So we are, um, that to us is, is very important just because you may think they may be busy on a medical call. doesn't mean that they may not have been able to get on the radio. We're not able to check their welfare. So we're make sure, making sure that they're safe. Um, also with us is effective interrogation of callers coupling the, the prompt processing and dispatch times because it's so important to make sure that we have dedicated dispatchers for these radio channels to make sure that the units are responding to the call as we're getting the information updated, especially for those high priority life-threatening calls for service that we have. Um, our dispatcher knowledge of geographical area that we're servicing is vital. Uh, one thing about um, our PSAP is, you know, our team members currently um, are, Coral Springs residents, Coconut Creek residents, and Margate residents. So they know the area very well and they're comfortable with it. And, you know, having that knowledge of the geographical area is, is, is key to um, helping service the community. Uh, most people don't know what hundred block they're in or what's the address to the McDonald's in the corner. They don't know that. Um, so by us knowing, asking them, okay, what business do you see? What is out there? It's very, it, it, that's why we make them go out there and do these um, scavenger hunts of what the main businesses are in the area, um, just so that we are able to better help and service uh, the community out there. And obviously the prompt activation of our mutual aid resources uh, for both police and fire. And at the end of the day, what we're trying to accomplish is a long-term relationship and partnership uh, with um, the city of uh, Coconut Creek at this point with when it comes to emergency communication services. And that's all I have. Any questions? Uh, I One comment, and then I'll let the team uh, give their questions. Uh, I like number four in your last slide. Uh, we already have a combined chamber with Coconut Creek. Uh, we do a lot with Parkland, including Sheer Fire. Our commissioner is an assistant city manager at Margate. And I think uh, thinking expansively and, and working with our adjacent cities uh, can only help all of us. So I, I think it's uh, good to have an expansive mindset. So with that, uh, Vice Mayor, would you like to go first? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Kathy, that was a very impressive and comprehensive presentation, um, very thorough. And I like the proactiveness of us being aligned with our neighbors, um, assuming that um, not knowing what the future holds, that it, in, if in need, we could also partner with the county as well with this type of system. Is that correct? Well, definitely with the EDC hub, we will be partnering with the county. Uh, this will allow us, um, especially um, in the research of after the uh, af uh, the tragedy at MSD, uh, was why we started looking into what solutions can we do? How can we solve the the problem of 911 transfers and be able to be interoperable uh, with you know the regional system um, and the plantation PSAP because they're the other non-regional PSAP? Um, and we discovered through research uh, this hub. This allows us, um, if another, you know, uh, high priority life-threatening call for service were to come in in a jurisdiction that it rings to us that they might be another jurisdiction for either law or fire, that we're able to initiate that call for service without having to transfer them. Um, so, for example, if we would have had the hub in place on that day, the, as, as we're putting in the call for service for fire units to respond, it would have simultaneously put in a call for service. Uh, for the Parkland uh, deputies to respond at the same time without having that transfer. That's the goal to be not only interoperable with our neighboring jurisdictions, but also with the neighboring PSAPs, because that's important as well. 
Vice Mayor, this would only work if we did partner with the county. Um, and that is one of the requirements. And, and we have had conversations with the county uh, on tying the hub into their system. And we're still working with them on that. But we definitely would, would partner with the county. Thank you. I'm satisfied. Gotcha. Commissioner Vignola. That's yeah, um, my understanding, you know, with, with the hub, regardless of what happens, if, if we join with any other cities or not, um, we are going to have the interoperability with the county. So I, I just want to make sure that the commission is aware. So, so we kind of separate that issue. You know, uh, one of the one of the biggest and, and toughest decisions um, I've had to be a part of was uh, going ahead. And when the county started their own their own system, um, you know, we got hit pretty hard. Uh, the newspaper, people running for office, people in the community, because we were going to pay an extra two million dollars a year. Our residents were. Um, to keep our own dispatch center. And I, and I applaud the city of Coconut Creek for recognizing that, um, you know, that the county system is not the level of service to provide for our individual communities. I, I think um, we were pretty steadfast in that and, and our police and fire chiefs at the time did an amazing job of pushing that. But, um, you know, in, in going ahead and, and going with our own radio system, with our own dispatch center, um, we really wanted to focus on providing a level of service for our residents. Um, when we talk about training our dispatchers and things for other communities, you lose that. You know, at some point, the counties, and then look at all the cities now that are complaining about the county dispatch center. Um, at some point, the counties got too big, and it's, it's a little too hard to manage and, and to run effectively and efficiently um, for the level of service that, that's really required for emergency services. And that is the most important thing that we can do as a city. What we provide is those public safety emergency services. Um, you know, we, we want to make sure that we control the equipment. And that's why we went ahead and bought the radio system that we did. Um, and we also want to make sure that we had kept it small for our community. We felt like if we joined that county system, yeah, that's great. The, the transfers is that we were all concerned about it. However, um, when you go ahead and we, we had a case a couple of years ago where, um, I believe it was a city employee that saw somebody fall into a canal when Hurricane Matthew came by. They didn't know exactly where they were, but they went ahead and they called 911 and they knew the exact canal based off of um, you know, our dispatch, did, thank God, based off of the description there. And, and that saved that person's life. And it was because the people were focused in on our community. Um, when you go back and you look at the tragedy at Douglas and, and 911 calls are coming in and then the county is saying, where's Stoneman Douglas High School? There's no excuse for that. And, and for me, you know, this is, this is one of the biggest issues. Are we, you know, is it our responsibility to provide these services for other communities? And, and risking, in my opinion, risking the level of service provided to our residents and our families. Um, you know, I, I think when, when right now our dispatchers have to know two cities, we start adding in three, four, five. I mean, it, it is going to be more of a workload. You're gonna to have to know more things in the communities. Um, you know, I, I just, for me, the, you know, public safety is number one. It's been number one focus of the city for many, many, many years. And I think going into business, providing services for other cities is not what we were elected to do. I believe we were elected to go ahead and, and make decisions for our residents, for our businesses. Um, and, and that's who we should focus on. If the if Coconut Creek or any other city, any other city wants to go ahead and, and get off the county system, I applaud them. However, I think it's something that really should be focused in and we should provide the level of service for our residents. We're a large enough city. We're, we're a big city um, when, when you look at everything and going and expanding out further. At some point, you start getting a dip in level of service. And that is my biggest fear when it comes to this. Um, and, and it was at the time of, of our public safety personnel. So that's uh, all I have for right now, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. I really appreciate your viewpoint. Along those lines, Frank, you may not have it readily available. I would ask to let us know what was, you know, what were, what were our stats before taking on Parkland and what have been our stats since we have. So, so Did mayor that, that yeah, great. That, that's not, that, that's not a, an available stat. And I'm gonna tell you why we've always had Parkland. Um, when Parkland had their own police service and volunteer fire department, we dispatched for them. So we've always dispatched for Parkland since, I want to say since the early 80s. Um, so um, they're, they're, Parkland is a very unique 
uh, um, level of service because we we integrated them into something we were already doing for them. We just changed the way we kind of do it. So we don't we wouldn't be able to provide those apples to apples. I know exactly what you're looking for, but it doesn't exist because Parkland was always on our CAD system. They were always on our radio system and we always dispatched for them even when they had their own public safety department and their volunteer fire department. Gotcha. Thank you. And again, Commissioner Vignola, uh, great viewpoint. I understand where you're coming from entirely. Uh, Commissioner Sarah, Commissioner Simmons, who'd like to go next? Commissioner Sarah, go right ahead. Thank you. Uh, Kathy, phenomenal presentation. I appreciate it. Um, Frank, just so you know, when we get to the point of voting, I'm definitely in my briefing. I need to spend some more time uh, on this particular item. Um, with Commissioner Vignola's comments, I, I couldn't, everything he said, I'm actually in agreement with. Um, so and I want to definitely learn more. Uh, Kathy, one of my, I guess my only question is, are there any glaring cons? I mean, I, I saw on the side, you know, the positives, but like from a staff standpoint, are there any um, concerns going into this? Um, staffing wise, are, I've been very open, at least with, with my team members of throughout this whole process, um, trying to get their opinion on how they would feel of an expansion because I, you, I feel you need your team's buy-in to see how they feel of taking on this venture because it is a big venture. And um, in speaking with them, they're actually excited just because a lot of them had vest, have vested interests in, in the city of Coconut Creek and even in discussions with the city of Margate, um, just because um, a lot of them grew up in this area, know this area, and they, they want to provide that level of service that we do for our residents to these areas as well. They feel that is well-deserved um, before the uh, regionalization, we worked very closely with Margate and Coconut Creek PSAPs when they had their own PSAPs. Um, we shared CAD systems with the city of Margate. So we were always working together. Um, not that we've stopped, but it's just been a little bit different just because of um, the PSAPs not being there. And the way our county is designed, you know, we're in the Northwest corner. So we're kind of our own little, little island over here. And having the Northwest portion of the county um, on one PSAP may be a good solution for closest unit response, interoperability. Um, so long-term, everyone that I've spoken to from my team members, they see it long-term as a positive um, for our PSAP as we grow, um, as a city ourselves, um, as with the city of Parkland, every time you know, the, you know, the city of Parkland has grown a lot throughout the years, we get excited for things like that. Uh, we love servicing the community and they have vested interests, like I said, in, in, in Coconut Creek uh, themselves, and they would be excited for their community to be receiving the same level of service as we provide to our citizens and visitors. Because, you know, when they dial 911, a lot of times they're like, I just wish I, I can, it just rings the Coral Springs. Um, you know, but obviously it's not feasible, you know, based on how it's set up right now. And, and I appreciate, um, you can't end your honesty on that response because that's kind of what I'm looking for, um, Mr. Babinick, when, when I get to my briefing. Obviously, you guys do a great job with the supporting documentation. Um, as you guys know, at least working with me the last 11 months, uh, I'm a little bit more on the visual side. Um, having having an opportunity to take a look and, and tour our dispatch center, I mean, I'm very proud of what we've done here. But like uh, Commissioner Bignola had, had eloquently said, I don't want to compromise um, our residents either by making this decision yes or no. So, um, you know, I'm definitely interested in um, learning more and um, I'm looking forward maybe Kathy to talk to you offline if possible, as well as anyone else on city staff that um, can uh, do the very best to bring me up to speed on this. Of course. Uh -huh. Thank you. Commissioner, Senator, one thing I will say is, is you and Commissioner Vignola have hit probably on the number one reservation we would have. And I draw the line there as well. Uh, this arc, you know, the, the city of Coral Springs level of service cannot drop 
uh, based on providing service to another community. So I can tell you that uh, the police chief would tell you that, and I'm going to ask him to speak on it uh, at the end here. I can tell you that IT, anybody who's been involved with this, that has been their number one concern. Thank you. Abby. And I appreciate it. Yeah, Go ahead. No, I just want to say good comments, Commissioner Sarah. If you have something else now, you can share. No, I, it's a workshop. I mean, I'll, I'll do my due diligence. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Great. Back to you, Commissioner Vignola. Thank you. And I just want everyone to understand, I'm not saying that um, staff is recommending something that's going to compromise public safety in the city. My, my fear, and, and look, I know that is at the forefront of everything you guys do, and nobody does it as good as you do. So please don't take this the wrong way. But there is no guarantee that it won't. And that's my fear, because God forbid it's it's one instance where something happens to one of our residents. How do we go to bed at night? Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. So I, I have a, another concern. I, I would like to ask a question. I've been waiting. Sure, Please. Sure. Go, go ahead, Commissioner. You go first. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Kathy, yes, a uh, great, great presentation, like everyone has said. Um, and I'm going to ask these questions, and I'm sorry if they've already been covered, but uh, my first one is who's paying for what? So the way that when we went into this venture together, city staff, when we all met, um, the biggest thing is this is a cost that Coconut Creek is taking on for their portion at 100%. It's not going to affect the cost for Coral Springs at all. They have been presented with cost of providing the level of service that they're expecting, the technology, um, the employees and everything, they're going to be paying for their portion of it. So financially, it will not impact the city of Coral Springs because uh, they're going to be picking up, I guess, their their piece on that. So the the new employees, their benefits, everything will be, they will be employees of the Coco of Coconut Creek. They would be employees of the of Coral Springs. However, the cost will be absorbed by the city of Coconut Creek. Including benefits and everything. Correct. Okay. Kind of the same um, thing we do for fire for Parkland. Uh, we would, it's the same thing. There are employees, but okay. we would cover the costs. Okay. And then as far as the office space equipment, all of that, that's all, that's all Coconut Creek. Yeah. All the equipment is part of the cost that we presented to them. They would be responsible to make sure that it covers the technology that we would need to be able to provide that service. Okay, so basically my final question is, we are not assuming any financial obligations by expanding uh, this other than when we got the CAD or whatever, but that was for bigger issues, but um, the actual expansion itself is not costing Coral Springs a dime. No, then, you know, we sat with, I sat with Catherine and with Stephen Dyer, RT director, we went line by line on every possible costs or anything that it could come up and we made sure we covered every nine item um, that it wouldn't cost the city of Coral Springs that whoever would want to join in this venture right now city of Coconut Creek that they would be absorbing the costs that correspond to them. Okay so next question uh, they get a new commission whatever a new bunch of people there and they all decide that they don't want to do they don't want to be a part of this anymore what happens? Well, with the ILA that we have presented to them, there are, you know, caveats to everything, just how we have our ILA with the city of Parkland, if they were to no longer need our services. Same thing with that, you know, they would be required for something when it comes to the employees responsibilities for that. There's different caveats in with, that we wrote within the ILA, I guess, um, with what would be responsibility of the employee costs uh, for equipment, everything like that. In there, we also put depreciation of technology is included in there. We made sure we covered everything just because we know as a city, you know, CADs don't last forever. So that has to be in there. The radio system's not gonna last forever. We just have to make sure that we have all those things lined in and that's included in their ILA as well, making sure that um, the equipment that even their public safety personnel carries does not compromise our system. They have to make sure that they're maintaining it um, especially for the radio system, I, I'm not willing to compromise it at all. So there's different things that we have outlined throughout the contract that while they're with Coral Springs that they have to maintain, and if they were to go out on their own, we also have included that in the ILA. Commissioner Simmons, uh, as well, you know, we, we've worked very hard to make sure there's no subsidy involved. 
<clears throat> from the Coral, uh, city of Coral Springs to the city of Coconut Creek. And we've gone as far as any money they pay into the system. If they decide to separate, they don't get a refund. Uh, that right. money does not go back, uh, you know, because that equipment, most of it's technology, meaning software. So it has no resale value. Um, so uh, if, if the commission gives consensus tonight to continue to move forward, we'll provide the commission with the ILA. We'll provide the commission with the spreadsheets and all the documentation uh, to uh, to have further meetings one on one to discuss uh, those parameters if it is the will of the commission. Anything okay. Well, I, I, I would like to say that. Well, sorry, final comment. Um, you know, I would like to say that. You know, um, you know, especially you, Frank. You know, being city manager and obviously your prior experience, um, that you know what you're doing and. I don't think you care any less about any resident in this city. I think you care about everybody. And I'm not, and this is not to you, um, Commissioner Vigno, I'm not like rebutting your, what you said. Um, you did raise some good points. Um, just for me, I would say me personally, I have faith that um, you all know what you're doing and that, you know, um, this isn't like some kind of cab grab. It's just like, you know, trying to make sure that the level of service we have, we can extend it. And if we're expanding and we're having the same, Way that we train the folks that we have now, I don't see how that won't be uh, included in that expansion. And so, um, you know, I have faith that you know our city isn't going to suffer, um, and I, I think I think we're going to be okay. Thank you. So, uh, I've got a, at least two questions. Uh, one is, does if we went through with this, does the city of Coconut Creek absorb the costs up front? as opposed to paying us after we have put forth the money? It's a great question, Mayor, yes. So um, we, we front, uh, I don't want to say front load, that's probably not the right word, but we've, we've made it very clear to the city of Coconut Creek, the budget departments have worked closely together uh, on those expectations. So we need, for example, we need to hire all of these employees before we could ever provide the service. So they actually start paying for those employees prior to us ever accepting a 911 call for them. Uh, all of the technology has to be bought up front. So they need to pay for that up front. So the answer to your question is yes, they pay for uh, the employees. They, they pay for our uh, human capital and our, our software and, and hard capital as we go. Gotcha. My second question <clears throat> is, is there a draft of an ILA in existence or it's an executed ILA? So on our end, it is a, it, you, you have not seen it. So the city of Coconut Creek sent the ILA that they had to their commission and they have executed it. However, I, again, I made it very clear that our commission has not seen it. So if there's something in that ILA that the commission is not comfortable with or wants changed, we, we would send it back to the city of Coconut Creek and they would have to send it back to the process again. Gotcha. Okay, well, you've answered both those questions with good answers. So if there were otherwise, I'd be uh, even more concerned. So I'm gonna share with you three other concerns I have. Uh, and I'm, I'm kind of you know teetering maybe between Commissioner Vignola's concerns and my deference to you and our team uh, in regards to this actually enhancing our public safety as opposed to putting it at risk. Um, so three other concerns and two are kind of interrelated. One is, you know, the budget. And, um, you know, we, we're gonna have this, I think the last estimate was about a $5 million shortfall and we haven't yet dealt with that. Uh, the second is the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd and the request for many for you know, action sooner than later. And many people are thinking, listening, looking for defunding of police. So the, in the current environment, there, there may not be uh, enough public support, no matter how you sell it. Uh, so I'd certainly want to hear from more people uh, about what this feels like to our community. Uh, and the third thing, and this is kind of related to the first, 
we're always asking you all to do more with less, right? We're constantly asking you to do more with less. And is this going to be able to help you do more with more? So, Mayor, I'll, I'll answer the last question because the first two, I, I, you know, I think were more of statements. Um, the last question is, is we feel that we've built in the additions to staff necessary to support this operation. Uh, we have an additional IT person in there that will be dedicated to dispatch. We have uh, an additional HR uh, person that will be helping out with um, uh, the staffing requirements. Uh, Kathy has added her supervisors and telecommunicators to be able to take on that workload. Um, so uh, is there more work? Yes. But are, are there more resources come along, coming along with it? Yes. Um, so we, we feel pretty uh, confident on that side of it. The first two statements, I, I you know, I, I don't know really uh, that I have an answer for those. Well, I, I, I didn't expect an answer for that. I just, I think we need more discussion. Um, you know, I, I haven't been able to share yet with the commission about my extended office hours and what I've heard from the community. We all have yet to really hear from one another um, about our experience in the community since our last commission meeting. Um, and, and I'll share more later, but I definitely think that we, we would need more input from the, I would need for myself, I would need more input uh, from the public before I could tell you, yeah, this looks good or no, this looks bad. Um, and I'm not sure if anybody else feels similarly, um, but I, I, I wouldn't be ready to say, yes, Frank, let's go with the IOA. Uh, so uh, any so further Ma comments, questions? Mayor, can I just say one more thing? Uh, I believe the ILA, you guys should have gotten a, 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 the draft or the, the copy of the current ILA uh, on Friday in your, your inboxes. So if somebody didn't get it, please let me know and I'll make sure you get it. But I was told Luam sent that to you on Friday. Thank you. And Luam has done an incredible job during this time. Really great. A lot of support. Anything further, Commissioner Simmons? Uh, I just I, I just would like to say that I didn't see this as I don't see this as uh, us um, increasing the police department's capabilities or anything like that. I thought I, I literally just saw this as a dispatch system, which everybody needs, especially when it comes to emergencies. So um, this is not I, I don't this is not the same thing as what this, the, the slogan defund the police means. Um, so I, I'll put that out there and saying that I don't this is not that particular type of situation. This isn't expanding or adding or giving more money to anyone. That's why I ask about the money and who's paying what and doing what. This is just extending the capabilities of this. I, I really appreciate that, um, that sentiment. Thank you, Commissioner. Anybody else? Commissioner Vignola. And just really quick, because I know people might think uh, based off my, my day job, um, this affects it. And, and uh, Frank, um, uh, John, and then and, and chief Harrison, we've had this conversation for years my opinion has been the same it has not changed for for many years um i just want to make sure that that's abundantly clear um you know and, and look I, I know staff feels that they could do this again there's no guarantees and that's that's always my bigger thing and and i think the city of coral springs does does better than the county and a lot of other agencies in almost every single area that we do i just don't think we need the headaches of going ahead and and uh, providing those services to other cities. We're not a county. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner Sarah, Vice Mayor Carter, anything else to add? Frank, do you have any questions of us? I do. So <clears throat> hearing what I've heard, uh, we have a commission meeting next Wednesday, which obviously I'm not asking to put this on the agenda next Wednesday, hearing what I've heard tonight. I don't think we're ready for that. We have a, a workshop or a business plan workshop the following Wednesday. So what we could do is we could, I, again, uh, make sure you guys have all the information, which I was, as I was told you have the ILA. We'll make sure you get all the backup. Um, we can cover this in depth one-on-one -on -one during your briefings. And if there's not enough time during the briefings, we can set other meetings. And then we can, we can discuss it uh, at the beginning of the workshop uh, on the 24th to kind of come back around and see if there's consensus to bring it to a commission meeting at that point, if you'd like. 
I, that sounds good to me. That okay with you all? All right. John, what? is there any uh, any legal issue with what I've what I've laid out? No, um, and, and that would just be uh, not for a vote again, but just for more uh, ferreting it out. You'd put it on a, a, another commission meeting later. Yes, sir. Yep, no problems. Mr. Mayor. Yes. So just food for thought, you know, how we deal with home rule on a regular basis, of uh, the state constantly telling us how we should operate and what we should do, even though we don't agree with them. And the potential for the state to do that with our communications and dispatch system, making us uh, work as a county is there. And I think if we had our own little Northwest corridor block, you know, that's proven that we're in a better position. That's just my two cents. Gotcha, food for thought. Uh, anything le left from you, Commissioner Sarah, or you're good to roll to the next one? All right, looks like he's good to roll. So uh, thank you for the discussion. Thank Kathy, excellent and thorough presentation. Uh, you covered a lot of details and, uh, and you're definitely thinking uh, in an expansive way and I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. So next up is commission communications and on the agenda is item 4 f.mpo and uh, Commissioner Simmons, if you'll take it away. Mayor, uh, just to remind Commissioner Simmons what this is about. Um, no, I remember. Okay. It's about the total run, the total run bike lanes improvement and all that stuff like that. That was yes, something sir. that was done like in 2012 with three other cities, but all the other cities pulled out. So it's kind of a thing like, why are we still doing this? So, and we have answered. All right. <laughs> Um, Susie or Julie, who's going to take this one? I will. Okay. So, I mean, really it comes down to the fact that, you know, the Coconut Creek pulled out of the project just because they decided to work with the Seminoles to do their improvements as part of their whole, whole overall, um, you know, downtown type area that they're doing. So, um, it, it may still include bike lanes on their part of the project. It's just not within the scope of the FDOT project right now. Additionally, Margate, has just decided not to do bike lanes for certain projects. You may remember they were originally included as part of the Rock Island um, project, and then they decided not to be part of that, and we decided to move forward. Um, this just is part of us continuing to build on our, our bike lane system that we've been focusing on in the, over the last several years, and just continuing to do that. that I think it's a good spot for it, knowing the uh, other uses that are along to run there, as far as, especially um, connecting with State Road 7 as well. Commissioner Simmons. Well, if, yeah, thank you. Uh, if you know the residents, if, if the residents are against it, uh, or if we have reports of residents saying that F dot's going to do, you know, X, Y, and Z to their property, and then that the residents are going to have to pay for it, I, I just, I, I really don't think that's right. I, I just, I do not think that's right. That you know, this project is going to happen against the wishes of the people that live there. But even if that happens, their yards or something like that's going to get ripped up. And that they'll be the ones that have to pay for replacing, you know, whatever damage or things happen to their property. I, I, like, I don't know how we, how do we rectify that situation? Well, I'm not as sure of anybody specific who have, may have said that their yard is going to be ripped up. But in looking at the, the plans that I have, um, they're really just working within the existing um, lanes that are there. Um, the, the curbing will be redone for the medians but the it says existing to remain on anything kind of past the curb on either side of the street so um if we know specific you know parcels that are having concern with something that might be going on in front of their property by all means we could reach out to them um if you want to have them give me a call i can chat with them about the project that's going on in front of them i, I will find the email and i will forward it over to frank and he can uh, get it over to you all to look at and figure out what's going on it just I, again it just you know I think I think the city needs to make a couple more calls with the total run folks and kind of get their view on, on this project. Uh, I really think it would behoove us to do that. We'll be happy to do that. We met on site with them about something else last week, so we'll be happy to chat with them again. Any, any Commissioner, anything else happening uh, with the MPO uh, that's newsworthy to us? Not, not really. I mean, we have a board meeting tomorrow morning, so if something pops up, I'll let you all know. I mean, 
over the last couple of months, we kind of just reaffirmed the voting structure. Um, I know that was something that they wanted to change or something like that. But um, other than that, due to COVID, things obviously have kind of not been regular like most things. Um, but we have our meeting tomorrow. So if anything of, of importance comes up, I'll uh, have an email sent out to the commission. Great. Well, thanks for representing us there, Commissioner. Um, so next on the agenda, and Commissioner Simmons and I both went to this meeting last year. We've talked about it before. I raised it at the uh, CIGC meeting a few months ago. It's a village square concept. And the village square concept started in Tallahassee. My recollection is about three years ago. And it's a group of not like-minded individuals that get together for dialogue uh, in a respectful way and uh, share about issues. And uh, my goal is that there couldn't be a time that's more ripe than now for us to implement a village square concept here in the city. My preference would be uh, to have it be citizen run and use the CIGC as a way to do it. Um, with um, so much polarization, I think to offer an opportunity to our citizens that is led by our citizens uh, to engage in respectful discussion about whatever issues, uh, including current social issues, I think could only benefit our community in great, great ways. And for me, uh, time is of the essence. So I would love to have your input, your support, your questions, your ideas. Uh, Commissioner Simmons, if you had something to add about the Village Square or how you may envision the Village Square being implemented, uh, I'd love to hear from any or all of you. Commissioner Sarah, you're unmuted first, so I'll go to you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I guess this would be a question for Frank and staff. Uh, with the Village Square conceptual idea, um, my first uh, blush on this would be that wouldn't this fall more under the Neighborhoods of Integrity initiative that we were trying to do? Possibly. Um, so, we, we wanted to wait till tonight to kind of hear what the commission wanted to see out of this concept because uh, we really don't, staff doesn't have a good handle on what this means. Um, and uh, we do have, you know, like the mayor said, we have uh, the cus customer involved government. That would be a good part of this. We do have the multicultural, we have MLK. So we have a lot of resources that could feed into something like this. I was waiting till tonight to kind of get the feel for the commission as to what you guys would look for out of it. And then I could better answer that. Uh, I know Susie's working to come up with um, framework for the neighborhood with integrity program and, and what that will look like. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it could be part of that. It could, it could be a fit within that scope. Well, the only reason why I bring it up, Mr. Marin, I mean, I'm not opposed to doing anything that's going to improve our community. <clears throat> culture within. <clears throat> it's just that when we, when I first joined the commission, we set goals and we have a lot that we want to accomplish and then everything kind of stalled, obviously, for the right reasons for trying to get order to the pandemic. But <clears throat> I, I mean, if this is something that we're looking at down the road, but um, I'm not obviously opposed in any way, shape or form, but there are some things that I'm passionate about, you're passionate about, that we've talked about, that we haven't even started. Um, and, you know, I guess we would have to go back and reprioritize uh, what we want to do. But um, I think this falls in line with a lot of different things that we already are uh, rolling out and successfully doing. I could be wrong because I, I need more information myself. Um, but I just want to make sure that we're not reshuffling the deck on some of the stuff that we already kind of put on staff to start. And then uh, we have, you know, another idea and then another idea and another idea. And we all have ideas and they're all good ones. It's just because uh, we all genuinely want to do what's in the best interest of the city. So just my two cents. I got you. Yeah, for me, it's not reshuffling the deck at all. Uh, it, this has been part of the deck, just hasn't been a priority prior to today. Um, it's become more and more of a priority in my mind. For me, it's up to you know you all whether you agree with me that it should be a priority now. For me, the methodology of having the village square, 
Uh, I'll be frank with you. If Commissioner Simmons or you, Commissioner Sarah, wanted to lead it, I'm happy for you to lead it. I just want to see it happen. Um, you know, I, I'll share a little bit about what has occurred during my extended office hours uh, last week and today. There were maybe 45 people on the call last week, about 35 people today. And there is um, just a, a hunger for something to occur sooner than later and not just words, but action. And I think if we were to set up the village square in whatever methodology uh, and say, yeah, you know, this is what we're gonna ask the, our staff to begin working on. Uh, I think it can address a lot of the social issues, even just saying that we're gonna start a village square tonight, I think would be very helpful to what our, uh, what our, what our citizens are going through. Who'd like to go next? Commissioner Simmons. All right, so um, as I understand how the village square is supposed to work, obviously we went, we both went to the same meeting and I actually talked to uh, some of the staff at that company um, that put it together to kind of get more of an idea of the event. Uh, it, I thought it was one of those, it's an event to tackle partisanship. Uh, and, um, you know, you get, Democrats, people that are Republicans, and you all sit down and like, you know, you have conversations and food and all these things like that. Um, my only reservation now, um, obviously, I, I like the event and I would have loved for us to do it, is how do we accomplish it in this COVID? You know, um, I don't want the same group of people that always talk to each other, you know, in committees and different things like that, because then we won't actually solve what we need to solve. I thought, you know, from the way they explained it at the conference, it was a much bigger event. And, you know, you had a lot of people and you had like really long rows of tables um, out there. So, I mean, I don't, I'm obviously there may be a way to do it. I don't know. Um, but the way I looked at it is supposed to be tackling partisanship. Uh, and, I mean, you know, it's a good way to have those conversations so we can get back to people seeing each other for who they are and not just what uh, party ID they, they um, go for. I will say, as we get closer and closer to the election, uh, I am a little more nervous about having this event. That doesn't mean I like courage. Um, just, you know, people saying this to participate. That, that's really all it is for me. Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah, actually, my idea for this to occur in the near future uh, would not be an event, it would be a series of dialogue. And in this environment, it would all be virtual. Uh, and that's what I said to me, the facilitator, or maybe, and maybe it would even, again, I, I, I'm not attached to leading this. I'm actually, to be frank with you, kind of attached to not leading this. Uh, I'm more attached to a citizen leading it, but if one of you thought, you know, or felt, well, I'd like to co-lead this, I'd suggest maybe even co-lead the dialogue with a citizen. I would not actually be present uh, at the Village Square. I'm going to continue to have extended office hours. I see you have your hand up, Frank. I'll call on you in a moment. Um, so my idea initially is just virtually, and I can tell you, you probably... I don't know, maybe 50 people from both the calls would tell you, ah, they love a village square and whatever form that looked like. But go ahead, Frank. So, Mayor, if you don't uh, mind, I'd wait, like... Frank, give me one second. I'm sorry. Yes, so this is not the same event. So this is... So basically the idea that we saw at that conference, you kind of taken it and wanted it to be something different. So this is yes. not kind of... So that, so that I understand, this yes. is not the same kind of idea that or the event that me and you attended, just taking kind of what they did and find different. And the other thing I have for that is I remember when we were kind of reorganizing the committees, um, the CIGC was supposed, they, they wanted to originally change it into where you did have those types of dialogues or something like that. But I know that, you know, obviously that wasn't the will, you know, we didn't, we didn't move in that direction, but this is, it seems like that's kind of like what you want to do now is when we, the, how we were going to originally do the CIGC. Is that, does that sound accurate? Uh, no, I mean, the CIGC would still continue as is. Uh, I, no, I'm not getting rid of the CIGC. I'm, I'm saying the, I, like the model that was presented to us to change the CIGC into that more uh, dialogue heavy and, you know, type of talking event or type of talking, you know, meeting where, you know, citizens get to interact with each other. That's what I thought that they were trying to move the CIGC to. I'm not saying to cancel it now. I'm just, I'm trying to understand what it is that you are presenting to us, that's all. Yeah, no, my, my presentation has nothing to do with what Melissa presented at that workshop.
You're, you're muted, Commissioner. Uh, no, I was just saying, okay, I got it. Okay, Commissioner Sarah, you're unmuted, and then Commissioner Vignola. Well, actually, I think Frank had his hand up. Oh, I'm right. so sorry. You're right. <laughs> yeah, Mayor, I, I just wanted to know if I could ask some questions as we go along, because I'm trying to frame this so we can make sure we're, we're getting the intent of this. So I heard two different things. I, I heard it's an event, which means it happens once in a while. And then I heard it was uh, kind of meetings, which means it would be on a regular schedule. So are we looking for more of like a town hall type thing where we're bringing in a, a, a group of folks uh, that are uh, um, of different, uh, like you said, different thought processes and, and not like-minded <clears throat> for, a, for a one day event, or are we looking for a series of meetings? That's, I just wanna make sure I'm getting this right. So this is my suggestion, that our pilot is one meeting. There is no plan for a series. Uh, and within the next three weeks, we invite whoever to be part of the Village Square dialogue. We'll call it Village Square, maybe put it in quotes and call it something else. Uh, and it's to talk about current social issues. Uh, but it, again, for me, I prefer to be led by a citizen uh, that we empower uh, to step up to that. For me, if Commissioner Sarah said, hey, these are the 10 people I, I want in my neighborhood of, you know, neighborhoods of integrity, and I want them to lead it. I say, great. I just want somebody other than me uh, to, to address these current social issues. So I guess, let me give you some more context. Um, so it, you can see I have a white color. So no, nobody has ever told me or, you know, I'm not afraid to jog because of my color. Uh, I'm not afraid to drive in Texas uh, like Sandra Bland felt some fear, uh, you know, many years ago and she was judged by the color of her skin. I'm, I, don't, I don't have that. So the, the anger that so many people feel because of what happened to George Floyd, I feel similarly, I can't own it because in terms of my color, uh, but I can own it in the regard to, you know, I grew up in uh, Washington Heights and I learned about the Holocaust at a young age and I had difficulty for years watching a movie about the Holocaust. I'm, I couldn't, I'm Jewish. And I went to Yeshiva in Washington Heights and it wasn't until my early twenties that I thought, okay, I can finally watch Schindler's List because I'd be so angered and, I, 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 and numb at points that how can 6 million Jews die, right? So I have similar anger. And right now what's happening in our country is happening in our community. Thankfully, we have a unique blend of an incredible police department, smart, intelligent, passionate people. We've had peaceful protests. One of them led by a 17 year old and a 19 year old uh, a lot of collaboration, cooperation, and what I'm hearing at these office hours and what I heard at the protest, and, and I went to the protest here last Tuesday, I think it was, maybe it was earlier, you know, these days are blending in. Uh, what I keep hearing from a lot of people is, okay, I get the talk, but how about the action? What's the action, and when are you going to take it? So, and I'm not hearing it's okay to take it in time. I'm hearing that maybe from a few people, but not the majority. So what I'm hearing is we need to take some action now. So I totally get, you know, the order of the agenda, you know, that you prepared and I've respected it. I respect it. You guys, you guys have the well, you know, you guys are well intended about our community. Uh, I've held these office hours because I want to listen out and I want to give an opportunity for our community to be heard. If I can dissipate some of the anger, maybe, you know, that's helpful. Uh, but I also don't have to dissipate anger. Uh, if you're angry about what's occurring and what has occurred, I, I think you have a right to be angry. Uh, so this village square to me is an opportunity for our citizens to be able to express themselves. Uh, we're, and I think we're at a point where there are four crises. You've got COVID, you've got the brutal murder of George Floyd by a police officer. 
you've got protests that uh, there are some protesters, but then there are some that are not that are looting. And then you have a mental mental health crisis. And, and maybe, maybe we even have financial crisis. So it could be five. So what I'm attempting to do with getting your support for the village square led however it's led as quickly as possible by whomever it's led by is to allow a forum. How, what it, whether you call it a town hall, I, I don't want to get caught up in semantics. Uh, you can call it whatever you want, but we're, we're giving an opportunity that's not just me having open office hours and inviting 40, 50, 100 people to attend, where it's the city, where it's the city inviting this village square and having conversation, having dialogue, allowing people to be heard, giving them an opportunity to be heard. And I, I don't think you can lose. I don't think you can lose. Vice Mayor. Okay, I'm on. Um, you and I've had this conversation before and I have absolutely no issues with people having a conversation and, and discussing the things that bother them, but we are getting way too close to the line of therapy and therapists and we are government, we're not therapists. We're not, I'm a real estate agent, a salesperson. I mean, I can listen to people and, and un outside of the color of my skin, I can't understand that. But. Um, I understand discrimination because I've been discriminated against a lot, not as much as some other people, but a lot. And I just, again, I have no issue with conversation, but the, when, the, when it's government running this, then to me, I, I start to get worried that we are bordering therapy. And that's a worry for me. So I just have to say that. Gotcha. Commissioner Sarah. I'm going to go back and, and first before I make any comments, uh, I mean, I, <clears throat> I hear and feel your passion. And uh, all of the points that you made around mental wellness and, you know, COVID-19 and everything else, I, I couldn't agree more. We, we have some major things as a country that we have to really get right in the future. And, and sooner than later, like you mentioned. Um, I also agree with uh, Vice Mayor Carter that, you know, there's some things, at least in my opinion, and this is just me, there's some things that we can do as a city and there's some things that uh, we can do as individuals. You do a great job with your office hours. We all have office hours. We do them in different ways. Um, you've led committees offline, not affiliated with the city and I appreciate your work there. We all are doing that in different ways. Um, the, the big thing for me, and, and this is just a comment to staff is, you know, for me, uh, with the times that we're currently in, uh, we, in order to do something that's really gonna be beneficial to our residents, if we're gonna put on an event, we need to make sure it's thought out from A to Z and it's, it's gonna take planning. And I also go back to the neighborhoods and integrity because everything that you just said, Mayor, is within the conceptual idea of neighbors, neighborhood, uh, neighborhoods of integrity, which is Coral Springs, building a culture where it includes um, residential participation and leadership, as well as addressing the issues while really servicing and supporting each other. So, you know, the village square concept, once again, I'm, I'm talking where I don't know every idea or finite detail of it, but I just will say that um, this to me, and this goes to uh, Mr. Babinek, our city manager, is maybe even more of a push for us to get the neighborhoods and integrity on the board sooner than later, um, because everything that we talked about in the summer retreat and any workshops that we had around this idea, is exactly um, addressing some of the issues that we are dealing with as city and as a state and as a country. Sounds good. It looks like a good partnership potentially. Commissioner Vignola, we haven't heard from you. Would you like to share? Um, you know, I look, I, I Mayor, I appreciate your your sense of urgency with this. I, I do. Um, but I would like to see uh, Commissioner Sarah's Neighborhoods of Integrity program up and running. And, and I'd like to, like, 
if we're going to do something like this, I'd like to see where that goes first. Um, hopefully get COVID behind us. I think um, it's important to go ahead and, and do something like this. And um, yeah, I, I think it's something that we, we should do and, and do through the strategic plan and, and plan ahead. Because I think that's, as, you know, if, if it's what you're trying to do, if it doesn't fit in the neighborhood of, uh, of neighbors of integrity um, priority that, that we've all agreed to push forward, um, I say go ahead and do it. I think it, it sounds like it, if it doesn't go in there, I, it's something that I, I think uh, we should do. I just think that staff right now is, is really uh, running thin. There's a lot of things going on. Day-to-day um, -day operations continue on for, for everything the city does. Oh, yeah, and go ahead and throw in COVID-19 and all the stuff they're doing with there. And that's, that's part of my concern there, too. I, I like to kind of see where that goes first um, before, before going forward. But I'm not, I'm not necessarily 100% against it or anything. I, I appreciate what you're trying to do. I just I'd like to see if Commissioner Sarah says that that's really going to fit into there, um, and if, if Frank wants to chime in and, and see um, if, if he feels that that's where it belongs, that maybe we try that first. If that doesn't hit the needs that you're trying to get to, Mayor, then we can go ahead and bring this back. Yeah. So I'm I'm not sure is uh, this is going to be up to you, uh, our city manager. Uh, our chief happened to be on my call today. Uh, and he expressed that he was pleasantly surprised uh, by the dialogue. Uh, and I don't know if the chief has an opinion on this or just wants to share his sentiments about today, but his perspective from being on the call today may give you all some more insight that I have not been able to share with you. And I don't know if that's okay with you, Frank, and if it's not okay, I, no problem. I have no problem with Chief Perry speaking. Okay, well, you know, I will tell you that as I said today on the call, I was uh, very impressed with the cooperative effort of everybody that was on the call. You know, we're, we're in we're in some, uh, you know, crazy times. And I really did expect uh, to get some more negative feedback and to hear uh, some more negative comments. And, and I have to tell you, they, they weren't there. Everybody uh, seemed to be, you know, moving in the right direction, uh, looking to solve problems rather than assign blame. And, you know, I think that that's the way to go. You know, look, anytime we can reach out, whether it be through the city, whether it be through the police department, it's a good thing. It's a good thing for all of us. Um, you know, this city is, is unique, I think. Uh, you know, we've always been a tight-knit city. And, and, of course, you know, we're, we're twice the size now since, you know, I got here. And uh, I'm sure we've all seen the changes. But, you know, the one thing that I think has remained constant is, you know, we've always been a tight community. And I, I, I have to say that uh, I was very impressed with the uh, meeting today. I, I enjoyed, uh, you know, participating and sitting in it. So, you know, in, in my opinion, anytime we can reach out and, you know, anything that we can do you know, to bring us closer together and develop more understanding, trust, transparency, it, it's a good thing. Thank you, Chief. So, so I would rather the Village Square be hosted by, by us as opposed to not the city. I think the village square will happen regardless because there's just people that want, want to have a form. So how about instead of a village square anytime soon, we have a town hall meeting on current social issues. Commissioner Simmons. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I'm, I'm just, I, I gotta admit, I'm just a little, a little confused because I'm trying to understand, you know, I get that you want to have a forum, you want to have dialogue, but I keep coming back to the CIGC because wouldn't that be the place to do that? Like, couldn't that be a, um, an event by the CIGC or again, like, I'm not sure if you really, I'm not sure if you really got the model that Melissa was presenting. That was the, I like how that, new model, not changing the CIGC, so please don't say that again, I'm not saying change the CIGC. What I'm saying is the model that was presented, it seemed like that was that type of, of, of committee or gathering that hint, that, that, that I guess provokes dialogue. So I, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm trying to, I'm just trying, I'm trying to understand, I really am. Actually, Commissioner Simmons, where you're going, I think is the solution that I think all five of us can buy into. If the CIGC can host the next meeting 
and just ha so at a normal meeting, you know, you only have room for X amount of people. At a virtual meeting, you can have 100 people. At the CIGC, host a meeting on current social issues. Take it from there. You guys okay with that? Vice Mayor? Yeah, I, again, I don't have an issue with conversations. It's when we get too close to that therapy line that I start to panic. Okay. I, so I, if there's no objections to that, I, let the CIGC, and, and I wouldn't be the leader of that meeting. Somebody in the CIGC would facilitate it. So if that's okay with you guys, Commissioner? Sir, I saw you on mute. Uh, I I don't know, I'm struggling, but I, I mean, I, once again, I'm, I'm going to go to your passion, you know, I appreciate and respect it and you're our mayor and uh, yeah, I'm glad that your meeting went really well. I mean, I, I'm all for dialogue. I, I think, you know, talking out issues and concerns is incredibly important and that's the way we learn <clears throat> and grow as individuals. Um, you know, I don't know, I think, jo I think maybe Commissioner Simmons was saying something or I don't know if he was talking earlier and he was on mute, but I, I, I don't know enough about Village Square or the conceptual idea. Yeah, so I'm, I'm moving off the Village Square. I'm just having the CIGC, just, just as I have had these office hours on current social issues, have the CIGC host an open meeting on current social issues. Doesn't have to be called a village square. Commissioner Simmons, is that okay with you? I mean, that's fine with me. I just, I want to make sure though that I think there's two things that are going to come out of this is that we really want to see Commissioner Sarah's neighborhoods with integrity get off the ground. So I got to make oh, sure I say that. I think well, really to be get frank with you, I, I wish we would have already seen it get off the ground. I love Sean's idea from the moment it occurred and, uh, and I, cert and I certainly don't want any of my ideas to interfere with that. I think your idea, Commissioner Sarah, uh, is going to be transformational. Well, I mean, I appreciate those comments, but when we decided and, and agreed upon as a group, it went from my idea to our idea. And that's why it's important for us to understand and respect each other's opinions. But also, I, you know, I just want to make sure that we're um, also kind of falling in line with what Commissioner Vignola said. I mean, staff, um, I can't even imagine. I mean, I know what it's like to work for the school district right now. And what used to be like a 10 hour day has turned into a 14 hour day. I don't know what it's like for staff, but I've talked to Frank a couple times. It sounded like he was um, powering through, but you know, I just, I'm all for open dialogue. I just want to make sure we're doing it the right way. So Frank, could you let everybody know the kind of staff time that was involved with setting up my two extended office hour meetings? Because I'm, I'm not, I'm not referencing there. your office hours. I'm just referencing everything that we've got going right now. Because we, as a commission, um, created a, a list for staff to work on for 12 months, and the pandemic has stopped a lot of that work. And rightfully so, we got a lot to do. This is not this is not a personal thing on you or me or Commissioner Vignola or Simmons, Vice Mayor. We all are doing a lot of work, and the city staff, I'm sure, is trying to support all of us. I mean, equally, I know that. So this was not a comment towards your office hours or anything else. I I wanted to stop that because this is not a personal thing. This is just me talking freely and transparency as a civic leader that's trying to just make a difference while I'm sitting in the seat. I got you. I'm also talking freely with transparency and with your guys' concerns about staffing. What I'm sharing with you is I anticipate the reality of staff time to set up a <laughs> discussion on Zoom for this. I don't anticipate it taking more than four hours. I, I don't see it. I, I think the time that Luam and Lynn spent uh, setting up the Zoom meeting and advertising on social media probably wasn't more than three hours. But Frank, I'd like to address that concern because I'd rather it be five of us saying, 
go CIGC with hosting this as opposed to three. So, so mayor, I, I, I don't, I don't have an account of, of how long it took, but what I can tell you is if the five of you tell us tonight that you would like CIC, CI, the customer involved committee to host a meeting that looks at uh, social issues, our current uh, COVID crisis, our current state of civil unrest and the financial crisis to hear what the community has to say to be the catalyst to uh, uh, the Neighborhoods with Integrity program, uh, staff will do it. Um, I can tell you, and, and Commissioner Sarah, I appreciate what you said with stopping on the other programs. A normal staff would have stopped, but you, this staff, you can't stop them. Uh, they know they have those projects out there and they continue to battle and, and work through them with all this other stuff. And um, I continue to be impressed by, by their ability to get stuff done with everything else they have piled on them. But you're right, at some point we gotta be careful with, I mean, we, at, at any point we gotta be careful with that. But going back, if, if, if CIGC is, is the place for this and, and that's what the commission gives me the direction to do, I will make it happen. Okay, with you guys? Yes, no, I, I, I got yeses from Vice Mayor and Commissioner Simmons. Commissioner Sarah, are you a yes? Frank's asking for five, I'm asking for five. No answer from the other two, Frank. Is three enough? I, I, I take direction from you guys and you tell me what you need me to do and I do it. Well, what I'm asking so, you is, do you need a majority or is do you need- I, I would ask John to weigh in on, on that. I think, I think, I think, I think with all the information that's been presented today, I think maybe we need to give our other two colleagues a little more time. Um, and that's, I guess that's kind of my, my thought process now is maybe they just need a little more time for information I, today. I mean, we're rolling, in, we're rolling into eight o'clock. So. so I want to tell you guys, uh, you know, as I'm, and I'm going to be very frank and transparent. Uh, Larry, I'm watching you at the team political forum yesterday. And I, I just have a world of appreciation for you for your commitment to the city, to the community, to our youth. And you and I think differently in a lot of ways about a lot of things, but I have no doubt that your commitment, number one is to the city of Coral Springs after your family. Um, and, and really I have Sean and Joy and Joshua. I think the world of each of you, I, I don't mind differing with you. I love it when we're all united and Commissioner Simmons with the, what you just said, and uh, I definitely, I'm going to give you guys more time. I, I hope I can enroll you in the near future. I respect your opinions entirely. And I love all of your hearts. I, you guys got me. And I'm very, very honored to work with you guys. So I'm moving on. Commissioner Comments. And thank you for listening. Commissioner Vignola. I, I, um... I just wanted to say before you went through with that, I, I'd like the opportunity to talk to staff directly on how they see, how they would see this working. Um, first time hearing it, so a little bit to digest. I'd like to talk to staff uh, in an intimate setting um, before we decide one way or the other to move forward with it. That's all I wanted to share. You got it. Thank you. you got it. Thank you. And and just uh, you know, for those of you that are watching, I think one of the things that we're doing is so important for us to do as a community you know, listen to each other, think about what one another is saying, take the time to digest it. And, uh, and, and even if you disagree, you can disagree respectfully. And uh, hopefully you guys can see uh, the consistency that we have to give back and maybe some different ways of doing so. So again, back and thank you all. Thanks for giving me the time. Uh, we got a little bit more time, at least before eight. I'm going to start with you, Commissioner Vignola. Any other communications? No, I, I just, um, you know, for, for we, we've got these workshops now going three plus hours at some, some points. We used to have them down to about an hour and a half and being able to get everything done. I, I don't know what the biggest difference is. I just, um, um, 
would like to see where I guess the, the rest of the commissioners are on, on moving these a little forward a little faster. And I know there's a lot of things going on right now. And I get like tonight's topic. The last time we had a workshop, I felt like it went pretty long and I don't know necessarily if it had to, um, but I like to look at maybe see what we can do to kind of streamline these a little bit. Um, so, so this way we don't have all the staff members. When you look at all the people in on this meeting and we're taking up their time and time away from their families and stuff. I just want to be respectful of that. And that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Larry. Thank and, and, you know, Mayor, one more thing. I want to uh, thank you and, and um, um, the rest of you guys and, and all the staff that did work on Team Political Forum and, and participated. I thought the event was great. And, Frank, I, I really want to thank you for your support with this and moving it forward in a different way. Um, but it was great. And I got a lot of positive feedback, not only just from the panelists, but from kids and stuff. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Ugh, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Nice Mayor. Thank you. Okay, so I have a couple of things. I was on a bunch of meetings this week. The Early Lear Learning Coalition may be looking to municipalities to assist in child care location sites, just giving you a heads up. Thank and you. And the county waste agreement still in process. They're currently looking at four different types of structure. There's another one. Um, uh, the landscape plan that we discussed last week, I, you know, I listed like four houses in the last couple of weeks. Landscaping makes such a huge difference in how people perceive a property. So a city's different, you know, just my thoughts. And you, I was wondering- I, didn't, I missed the earlier part of the landscape. Are you suggesting we do something different with ours? No, 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 I like that plan. I like okay. the plan with that. Okay. So um, what is, with the virtual meetings ending on June 30th, what does our future look like? That was a question I had. I, the virtual, I, we're going to go beyond June 30th um, be, be, because of uh, the, the uh, current climb in, in COVID cases. Um, I, I don't foresee us stopping the, unless the governor doesn't extend the order, obviously. But from, from a practical purpose, I see us going beyond June 30th. From a legal perspective, uh, I don't know if we know that right now, John. We, we, are, yeah, we are working in all of South Florida. Uh, is working to get the governor to continue it. Believe it or not, the governor actually had it at one point in July, mid-July, and then when he did the new order extending it, he, he brought it back, I think it was inadvertently to June 30th. We're, we're, we're rather confident he will extend that. And even if not, um, there's no statute that requires us to be in person, so we would work through that as well. So I appreciate your comment, uh, uh, Vice Mayor. I was gonna bring that up at the next meeting when I read the virtual but that's where the status is. Hopefully next meeting, we will have more information. So thanks for bringing it up. Okay, thank you. And so my last one is, um, you know, one of the meetings I was on was a big discussion about the county's uh, share of funds. Boy, did I hear so many different numbers, 330, 335, 340, 355. Anyhow, plus the state getting money. Do we have any update on, I know they had a meeting today we hear anything? I've heard that the commission's receptive in sharing, but the administrator is not. So the state announced today that they're going to be divvying up the they, they haven't given us all the details, but there was something sent out saying the state's going to be divvying up that $119 million amongst the counties, urging the counties to share it with the municipalities. Um, so that's kind of they're not giving it from what I read today. They're not giving it directly to the municipalities, which goes against the uh, League of Cities plan. Or, or request, I should say. Thank you for that update. I'm done, Mr. Mayor. Great. Thank you. Commissioner Simmons. I'd, I'd, I'd ask that Commissioner Sarah go first. Uh, my two things are a little heavy. So. You got it. You got it. Is that okay with you, Commissioner? Always. Yes, Great. no problem. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I just wanted to say that uh, I appreciate the um, request, and I, too, just wanted a little bit more time for staff to um, be able to, you know, give me some feedback to the questions I'm going to give them on that. So I appreciate it. You bet. Um, Commissioner Simmons had a great idea to let you guys digest it more. Yes, he, yes, he did. Yes, he did. It's a good All team. Right. It's a good, um, team. Yeah, good team. Good team. But uh, I wanted to uh, first happy belated birthday to our city attorney, uh, you know, extraordinaire, Hearn. And then as far as uh, staff is concerned, uh, you know, I had to give a shout out to Commissioner Larry Bignola. Um, just a phenomenal job um, leading uh, from a commissioner level with the team political forum. Uh, I thought staff did a phenomenal job delivering uh, the event last night in very difficult times. I've attended that event um, 
quite a few times. I don't know the exact number, but uh, I really enjoyed participating first time as a panelist. But uh, more importantly, I thought the questions were just outstanding by the students to share. And um, I thought the answers were very well delivered. And uh, Commissioner Vignola, once again, thanks for your service over the past eight years with that. Uh, once again, you, uh, you really outshined yourself last night along with the entire uh, city staff. Um, I have to put a plug in here and, and Frank, I'm gonna pose a question to you. Is it possible in the future at uh, a workshop or a commission meeting um, you can give us an update on the graduation parades from a, from a financial uh, cost side. The reason why I'm asking is because uh, in the communities, in the residents, and the people that participated, uh, it was just an uplifting, positive, really good thing. And you know, I would want to propose it to the commission uh, once we had some data and uh, some more information on the potential of maybe doing this um, in a non-COVID-19 year um, and may make it a tradition if it's not too cumbersome on the police and the city staff and so on. Because like Get I said, report on that. Then... Sean, you're freezing up. Very difficult time. It was very uplifting to the kids and their families. <laughs> and, um, and maybe you'll have that. Um, I'm, uh, like many of you, I, I'm um, and then some conversations with some problems. Uh, with my oh, am I? Uh, Commissioner, you're having some technical difficulty. You're freezing up. Yeah, you're still freezing up, Commissioner Seren, if you can hear me. Mayor, I'll have uh, Deputy City Manager Kern. I'll reach out to him over the phone and see if we can get him uh, get him some technical assistance, if, if you'd like. Yeah, so we'll go to you, okay. Commissioner Simmons. All right, guys. So, um, yet to Commissioner Vignola, yeah, bang up job, uh, making sure that we still had the same political form uh, last night. You know, could have, you could have easily just, you know, let it go by the wayside, but you still kept it moving. I think that was really great. So, um, you know, good job of, of uh, raising the bar and, and keeping these students in, involved and the community involved and having them get face-to-face -face time with their representatives is, uh, is, is just a really good. It was really good. Um, so thank you for having us last night um, as well. So again, thank you, sir. And I look forward to um, taking on the mantle from here. And uh, you've left it in such a great shape. And I, I will hope that I can continue to do as good of a job as you have done all these years. Very confident, um, a much better job, my friend. You'll, you'll take <laughs> Looking forward to watching. <laughs> um, all right, so the last thing, um, can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right, so uh, there are two, two things I want to bring up to you all. So the first thing is Juneteenth. Um, I, obviously, because of sunshine, we all can't really talk. Uh, but, you know, I would say maybe in the beginning of the year, or even early last year, I mean, late last year, um, I talked to city staff about having a Juneteenth event. Uh, and so, you know, we had something already kind of mapped out and, you know, you know, what we wanted to do, obviously we couldn't do that event anymore. It was going to be, you know, a big outdoor event and things like that. And, um, hopefully we will be able to do it next year. Um, this year, um, you know, June 19th is Juneteenth. That's next Friday. Um, we could either do something on Friday or Saturday. I know staff is still working it, working on that. But, you know, I just wanted your, your everyone's support on getting that done. Uh, you know, I know we talked about our plans and stuff earlier, but this was something that was already in the pipeline. But we just had to kind of readjust it. And, uh, you know, I'm sorry for coming back to you all so late about it. But if you're not sure, Juneteenth is the celebration, or I guess I would say the uh, remembrance of the day, the last day that the slaves in Galveston, Texas, uh, found out that, you know, they were freed under the Emancipation Proclamation. And this is part of a bigger push nationwide to get, you know, more light on this uh, day. And, uh, you know, we're even working at the federal level to get it turned into a federal holiday. Uh, so, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, I can get your support in, in getting this event done. Um, you know, staff already looked into it. They know everything, you know, what they want to do. Uh, it's not, it's not been too burdensome and it's actually not going to be, um, 
you know, it's not going to be super costly uh, for them to do the event that, you know, hopefully they'll be able to do. And I'm sure they'll, you know, let you all know more about it um, over the next couple of days. So, you know, what do you, what do you all think on that? I'm going to pipe in here first, Commissioner, uh, because on both the call, so many people wanted a Juneteenth event and hosting that Juneteenth event will help a lot of people right away. Uh, and I think it's important. So you have my support. Sean Sarah, Commissioner Sarah. I'm sorry, I just rejoined my computer. Um, so <laughs> I, I missed part of what he said there. So I apologize. Uh, it's about it's about trying to get a, a Juneteenth event um, going. I mean, um, I had said earlier that, you know, late last year I had already been in contact with staff and already started talking through what we wanted to do for Juneteenth. And it was something that was already planned, but obviously due to COVID, we can't do it the way we want to do it before. Um, so staff has come back with this, you know, different type of event for Juneteenth. Um, I, it, like I said, it's a bigger, a, it's a part of a bigger push uh, nationwide to get more recognition on the on, on Juneteenth. So I was looking for commission support to kind of move forward with it. Uh, you're looking to do it virtually? Yeah, yeah, something like that. I'll let Frank talk if he wants to talk more about it. I know they're still looking into it. Sure, Frank. Sounds what are good. some ideas that you guys have come up with with the possibility of this? So uh, as uh, Commissioner Simmons said, staff was working on a much larger event, but unfortunately, we it would be against both the state and the county order to host that type of an event right now. So I've, I've challenged staff uh, to come up with some very loose guidelines because we just started kind of revamping this today. So we would look to hold a hybrid event where we brought in a dozen or so people in an appropriately sized room with proper protection, proper social distancing. And we would set up a program to where Josh would, would be the MC of the event. And um, we would do, somebody would give the history of Juneteenth because I've, I, I'll sit here, I'm gonna be a hundred percent honest with you, Josh. I didn't know what that was until you said it. And I went back and read it and did some, uh, some research. So I, I had no idea what that meant. So we would like to do a history of it. So folks know what it is and then kind of go into some kind of inspirational musical performance. So we would ask one of our local uh, and we would tape this ahead of time. It wouldn't be on site. So we would tape something ahead of time and we would play that. Uh, then we could do something along the lines of talking about the emancipation memories and kind of maybe some speakers read on what actually happened on that day. Uh, some of the historical significance of what happened that day and have some people read, some folks read the, uh, the historical significance of, of the emancipation. Um, Josh had wanted to uh, initially talked about doing some spoken word. So maybe we could get a couple of folks to do a spoken word message that we would pre-tape and we would play that. Um, that would be part of that. Or that could be part of the folks that are on site. Either way, that, that, that's okay, because that would be just one or two people. Uh, guest speakers, uh, we would have some folks come in and give some type of a speech, almost like a keynote, if you will. Um, and then we were going to talk to, uh, we know that there's a, a couple groups that have step performers. So maybe if they're still practicing um, and they're doing it within the social distancing guidelines and the CDC guidelines, we would go out and tape a step performance and have that be part of the, the program. Um, and then, um, you know, some, some closing remarks, uh, you know, and kind of just kind of piece all of that together. Our, our, we would stream it live online. So anybody with any kind of technology could watch it, whether it's a phone or a computer, uh, they can watch it from anywhere. Um, and we would also put it on C city TV. Uh, we could re replay it because everything will be recorded. So we could replay it again at a later date. Um, <clears throat> so the, 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 really the concept is, is whoever's on site, whether we do this in the commission chambers or we do this elsewhere on city property, the whole, uh, purpose is whoever's on site are representing the community at large. So the folks that are in that room that are part of the in-person event, if you will, that's being broadcast are representing the community at large. So that's kind of the overview of, of what we came up with as staff uh, today. So Josh, I know you're hearing some of this for the first time, um, but that's what we came up with. Okay. And so um, 
I'll just ask of you, Frank, let me know what you need me to do to kind of help out. Um, um, you know, just shoot me an email, let me know if I need, you know, what groups I need to look for or whatever, so that I can, you know, help because, you know, obviously time is of, of the essence. So, yep. um, you know, we definitely want to reach out to the MLK committee there. They have so many stories on that committee. Um, and, you know, we can, uh, you know, talk to some of them too and get some of their history as well. Um, so that's great. Okay. And then the second thing, um, everyone, sorry, last thing, I'm on 2%, so I'm going to hurry up. Oh, I'm sorry, um, Josh, we oh, just need, do I have consensus, Mayor, to do to oh, move yeah. forward? Yeah, my support. Everybody else's? Sean's got his hand up. Okay. You got it. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I'm, I'm supporting it. All right. Great. So last thing for you, Joshua, and then Sean, I'll come back to you. All right. So um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right. So um, uh, obviously with everything that's been going on with the issues discussing, um, you know, policing, um, I have asked staff if uh, I can put together a task force involving uh, community members, and I would be the, li the, the liaison between the police department and the community members uh, to discuss uh, different things that we can do to uh, improve the law enforcement profession through our, our police department. Um, I know that um, uh, Chief Perry and uh, both the Deputy Chief, Deputy Chief Backer, Deputy Chief um, McKean are um, interested in being involved in this process as well. And so I'm, I'm asking for your support to be the liaison uh, between these community members and the police department to uh, begin these discussions and, you know, come out with a, a collaborative effort to improve um, uh, the policing profession. You definitely have my support, Commissioner. Thank you. Vice Mayor, thumbs up. Commissioner Vignola, Commissioner Serra. Uh, Commissioner Simmons, uh, you, and I'm sure you're receiving some of the emails that uh, we all are um, regarding is, and everything. <laughs> yeah, is, um, you know, some of the residents are, are asking for information around defunding police. Um, mm -hmm. Is that going to be a component of the task force? Because I think education, um, you know, if, if you're going to launch this task force, which I fully support, uh, especially if uh, Chief Perry and his team are going to be involved, um, that we're doing our best to bring um, the information forward with that conceptual idea. Right. And so um, I think what I don't want to get hung up on is the actual word or the slogan, defund the police. I, I think there's just a bad narrative behind that um, because it's not necessarily saying that um, they want to abolish right. the police. And, and I'm not bringing up, I'm not bringing up defunding the police. I think that, again, it's a terrible um, terrible slogan. I think what the message that it, it's trying to say is that it's a reallocation of resources, of some resources to go towards more community. Necessarily trying to get rid of the police department. And I've, I've had discussions with uh, Chief Perry and both the deputy chief, and uh, we all set expectations. So everybody knows what we're doing with this mission. And it, it's purely collaborative on all fronts. Does that, does that help you, Commissioner, sir? It looks like he might be frozen again. I thought okay. he was just like really paying attention and listening <laughs> intently. And now, and now he's moving. Oh, uh, you're back. Frozen? I don't know. So, I was gonna say, uh, did that answer your question, yeah, I, sir? Yes, it did. And, uh, you know, I, I that's exactly my point is, that, you know, you just simply right. bringing up the word defunding. And instead of reallocating or whatever. So I, you know, the big thing is with the initiative is just educating and, and creating an opportunity for people to get informed. So um, I, you answered my question. I appreciate it. Thanks. No worries. All right. So Commissioner Simmons has a consent. Along those lines, Commissioner, before we get back to you, Commissioner Sarah, uh, you might have been asked to take the grassrootslaw.org pledge uh, part of the grassroots law project. Obviously, we don't have any time to discuss it tonight. I've been requested to take the pledge. I've told them there's no way I could take it without discussion with my commission. So certainly I would ask for that to be on the agenda uh, at our next meeting or workshop. Again, I don't know if well, you- I will, I, will say, I will say that I, I haven't looked into it. So I'm not sure exactly where it came from. And I'm, I'm a little wary of signing things. So I'm not necessarily- 
going to sign it doesn't mean I'm not pledged to do whatever I'm going to do that's in the best interest of the city. Um, but I'm a, I'm a little wary of all the things that, you know, people are going to want us to sign. I usually don't sign too many uh, pledges. Uh, it, and that's just my personal feeling because I know the work I'm doing. So. And, and, and Mayor, thank you. Yeah, we brought that up at a couple of the commission uh, 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 meetings, and I will be happy to, to discuss it with everyone as well. And uh, that's, and that's a good point. And Mayor, you're very good about it. And, and, and three or four of you actually forwarded that to me. We don't have to sign those pledges unless the, the commission's part of it because you're signing as your position. So thank you for all you guys are doing with that. You bet. You bet. So Commissioner Simmons, are you done with your communications? I'm done. I'm done. Thank you all for entertaining me. Um, I tried to be as short as I could be. <laughs> Great. Commissioner Simmons, thank you for your leadership. I appreciate it. Commissioner Sarah, back to you for what you got cut off. Uh, I appreciate it. I, I think I covered everything in uh, Commissioner Simmons. Um, brought up something that I wanted to discuss. So I'm good. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Great. Uh, so not an answer now, but Joy, for next time, if you can update us on what's happening with the memorial uh, for the 17 lives that were lost on February 14th. Uh, I, I have an idea. I'd like to, oh, Vice Mayor? I missed the last meeting. I was doing the food service. Oh, well, whenever you can get us information, uh, that would be great. Uh, I have a, an idea, and if this can work out, I'm waving because I'm trying to get the light back on in my office, but it's not coming back on. Um, since this is Commissioner Bignola's last term, and he served uh, for so long and so well, uh, I would like us uh, to have a state of the city, whatever it, it may look like, and this is, it has to be okay with you, Commissioner Bignola, uh, and I would like Commissioner Vignola to lead it. Um, I'd like, uh, and, and years past, and I think you might have been at the earlier ones, Commissioner Vignola, it was, it was a live event, and it was, uh, you know, led essentially by, um, you know, primarily the commission and the city manager, uh, but I would love for you to have the opportunity uh, to lead a state of the city uh, bef as, as part of your legacy. Um, so if that's okay with you, Commissioner, and then I'd ask the commission uh, if it could be done, uh, I would love for that to occur. Well, I appreciate it. Uh, I'd rather not put all, everyone on the spot with this. and, and We can talk about it. And and like, and, and, and Mayor, I, I do appreciate that. You know, the, the state of the city, we, we used to do a nice big live event. Um, unfortunately, um, 2018 was canceled because of the tragedy at Stoneman Douglas. Um, uh, 2000, or I think we might have done it later on. Um, 2019 um, was was obviously chaotic with um, the passing of, of our mayor, and and then um, you know uh, Dan Daly was leaving the commission and the elections and things, and um, obviously this year. So anything that we do would be a little bit different. But I'd rather give everyone the opportunity to talk to Frank and kind of see what that would look like and everything first. And and I do, I really do appreciate that. That's very kind of you. Yeah, first, I just want to make sure it's okay with you. And by all means, yes, I'd want them to talk to staff and be comfortable and, and not and not have to say their intention now. But that I want to make sure that was okay with you. Yeah, I, I, like I said, I'd like to talk to staff first and sure. give everyone an opportunity, but thank you. You bet. I appreciate it. Uh, and um, if, if we could do a joint letter to Jared or whomever to try to get that FEMA money, I have an update, Mayor. Great. Uh, hopefully by commission meeting, I, there may not be a need for that. Oh, so, great. Uh, staff has been working very, very hard on this. And hopefully by the commission meeting, I will have uh, some good news for you. So if, if we need to do it, we can. Uh, but uh, I would hold off on that until we can uh, see what happens the rest of this week and, and early next week. Great. Uh, well, I've complimented a lot of people here. Uh, one other person I'd like to compliment is Lynn Marzel. Uh She and her team have been doing an incredible job with messaging, communication, listening, and pivoting with social media posts. And uh, you've got to be on it really 24-7. And Lynn, you're doing a great job. So I just want to say thank you to you personally. And that's all I have. Are we ready? To, <laughs> are we ready to adjourn? Frank, John, anything else for us? I have nothing further, Mayor. Great. We're adjourned. Thank you all for a great meeting. Stay safe. Good night. Night. <laughs>